evening. Uh, welcome to the regular school committee meeting of Thursday, February 27th. Um, I'd like to begin tonight's uh, open session with a public hearing on the fiscal year 2015 Arlington Public School budget. Um, seeing no one here at the moment to speak on that, uh, we'll leave that door open because it's scheduled from 6.30 to 7 p.m. this evening. So should anyone else uh, come into the room uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll call them up and have them speak. There'll hopefully be another opportunity to speak on the budget as well, and we'll get to that later on uh, in the night. Um, for my opening remarks, um, Again, my, my name is Judd Pierce. I'm chair of this fine committee. Uh, the subject tonight for me to speak on is thinking outside the box. It's more than a cliche, I believe. Uh, Wikipedia defines a metaphorical box uh, or outside the box as something that can be real and measurable, something perceived as budgetary or organizational constraints. And we may feel trapped in a box by talking about the budget, as we're going to do tonight. It's one of our most important functions on the school committee. But I assert we shouldn't feel trapped in the box. For example, uh, Mr. Hainer and I, the superintendent toward the Audison Middle School this morning, we saw firsthand the work that our instructors and educators and specialists are doing with our children every day. I was very impressed with the students' attention and work. I saw our librarian, Edith Moissant, in uh, the library. She was in action. She was talking about her work, what she's doing, the authors she's bringing into our schools, the newsletters that are coming out, et cetera. I saw posters up for the upcoming performance of Guys and Dolls at the middle school next weekend. We watched our children exercising in the gym by playing basketball, exercising in their minds in the classroom with the science projects such as water rockets and air balloons. Amazing work is being done in our schools within our budget and our facilities constraints. This year in my opening remarks, I've often relayed anniversaries or this moment in time events because I feel it's useful to look back in our history to get some direction on where we're going. Two days ago would have been George Harrison's 71st birthday. George was lead guitarist for a pretty famous rock band. The Beatles were around in the 50s and the 60s and had an immeasurable contribution to our culture and to our music. Right, Bill? Absolutely. Mr. Hainer was around then. That's amazing. <laughs> um, just a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of watching the 50th anniversary of their appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. It was a special on CBS. It was a great, great program. If you haven't seen it, please try and find it and enjoy. It was such a special evening of musical tributes and history. It was kind of like a history lesson of sorts. What it taught me, and in part I already knew this, the Beatles thought outside the box, creatively, unconventionally. They took chances by stopping touring in 1966 and devoting their energies to the music studio and finding unique, innovative sounds that mixed a variety of cultures and times. As we move forward with our responsibilities this evening on our budget and setting our priorities for the schools, let's remember that we're moving across a long and winding road and we'll continue to work to make the school district the best it can be within the resources that we have and it is already happening. I would like to um, take a moment before we open it up to public participation um, on a sad note to uh, ask for a brief moment of silence for the passing of Coach Ed Burns. Um, Ed was a devoted family member, uh, loving uh, member of town. Uh, everyone knew him from athletic uh, endeavors in the schools and, and beyond. 50 uh, years in ice hockey, 21 years coaching football. Um, his winning percentage was amazing. He's a native of Arlington and um, it was very, very sad news that we, we learned about his passing just a few weeks ago. So I'd like to ask for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. All right. Public participation. I see a uh, gentleman. Uh, would you like to come up to the desk for us then? Hi. Um, my name is Dante, and I actually, I didn't expect didn't expect to actually be leading off the meeting, which is effectively <laughs> what I'm doing. But um, uh, I actually expect, expected a, a room that was overflowing. But I know that there has been, I'm coming, I came here to speak to you about uh, the curriculum in the elementary schools. And I know that there have been some people who have voiced uh, dissatisfaction with the curriculum that's in place now. Um, 
for Tools of the Mind curriculum and particularly the dreaded Jack and Annie books. Um, my, do I'm a, I'm, my daughter who is in kindergarten is my first, is my oldest child. So I am new to participating in the, uh, the whole town education process. Like, like most parents, I, I, or most residents, uh, I, I wasn't that interested until my children were in the, in the system. Um, and I actually, uh, I regret that. But um, I have to tell you that that program that is currently being used, the Tools of the Mind, has been um, very beneficial for my daughter. She's, uh, the term the, the teachers use is self-regulate. It's just, she's grown tremendously as far as self-control and the ability to uh, little things like wait for others, uh, not demanding immediate uh, attention. Um, the Jack and Annie books she enjoys. Uh, they seem to stimulate her curiosity about other places, other times. Um, and I don't know how familiar you all are with them, but it's, you know, it's, it's not fine literature. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, but the flip side is that that's not its purpose. Um, you know, if, if we, uh, you know, if we read them Dickens, we'd be exposing them to fine literature, but they'd tune out in a minute and a half. Um, in, in my opinion, and I'm not a professional educator, but I'm reasonably intelligent, and the purpose of it is to engage the children so that they, they learn. And these books are very engaging. Uh, I know that some people have grumbled that the, the two main characters are white middle class, and it, it, it is what it is. But they, they go to all different kinds of places. It's terrible. It's definitely not sexist, uh, simply because the female character is, is strong and uh, uh, brave, and the, the, the male, well, that, it could be sexist, but it, it's not <laughs> sexist in a traditional sense. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, let's just say it doesn't, it doesn't, create traditional gender role models, or t traditional gender, gender roles. Um, so anyway, in, in, I don't need to go on and on. I'm, yeah, I'm one person who is in favor of the current curriculum. Uh, I've seen great growth with my child. I've seen growth with our, our neighbor's children who are also in the curriculum. And uh, that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Anyone else for public participation tonight? Okay. Um, before I get started in introducing our next uh, special guest, I'd like to introduce a few other special guests that we have here at the table tonight. Caroline, Caroline Murta, uh, senior on the Student Advisory Council, is our student rep here tonight. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. Feel free, free to chime in whenever you'd like. Uh, Siobhan Foley, AEA rep. Uh, thank you, Siobhan, for being here. Um, we have some student art up as well. I'd just like to point that out because we didn't have the meeting a couple of weeks ago. Thank because of the snow, but we uh, are getting to it now. Uh, Stratton and Thompson uh, children did lots of interesting pieces around here. You'll see the kindergarten primary color paintings up, which I believe is probably over there. Um, they were using the paints to explore in the art room and they used different kinds of paint and uh, they chose how to, uh, which correct type of brush and how to care for their tools. Oh, thank you. And they were free to choose their own subject matter, red, blue, and yellow, the three primaries. Uh, first, they were disappointed with just three colors, but they soon discovered that they could work an infinite number of new colors out. So thank you, kindergarten students of Thompson and Stratton. First graders did heart resist paintings. First grade students learned about the art of Jim Dine, and they looked at many of the wonderful paintings of hearts. And some students had even uh, seen his sculpture, Two Big Black Hearts, in person at the De Cordova Museum. And uh, they drew hearts using oil pastels. Very, very nice. Mm -hmm. Second grade snowman paintings behind uh, the audience here. Um, the second grade students were introduced to value, one of the elements of art. And they discussed the way artists use value to create an illusion of three-dimensional space. And they explored with mix, mixing tints and shades. And they used white, blue, and black paint to create nighttime paintings of snowmen. Good for that movie Frozen that's out right now. <laughs> Fourth grade prints are over there behind Mr. Schlickman. They were introduced, the fourth grade students were introduced to the art of printmaking through creation of relief prints. After looking at a variety of landscape prints, students got to work on their own. And some students used printing plates made of soft balsa wood and others used plates made of styrofoam. 
and using pencils, they inscribed lines into the printing plates. They were then inked using a brayer and water-based ink, and the highest parts of the plate received the most ink, and the inscribed lines remained ink-free. Very unique. And finally, fifth grade observational drawings to my right, fifth grade students completed a classic lesson in observation when they drew their own shoes. They were asked to remove one of their own shoes and place it on a table and closely observe the shape of their shoe. And they moved it around until they found an interesting point of view. And they noted areas of light and dark about which they were worn. And they used pencils and worked hard to capture the unique qualities of their shoes. Those are very, very nice. Strat Stratton and Thompson children, Thompson principal Sherry Donovan and Stratton principal uh, Michael Hanna, thank you. Our teacher is, the, is Deborah Campagna. All right, moving on. A little earlier than you expected. And you'll have to remind me again of your first name. It's, it's Miss Stewart, Emma Stewart. Please join us, come, come to the table if you would, take the mic. Sit, whatever's most comfortable. <laughs> or listen to Mr. Hamm. <laughs> you refrain. You're not. He gets to decide in a month. He's getting you know? punchy in his last few minutes. Good evening. My name is, in fact, Emma Stewart, and I am a junior here at Arlington High. I am here tonight to request the addition of a high level class focused on U.S. government and politics. I want to start by thanking everyone who's been a part of the initial conversations and everyone who has encouraged me up to the point of presenting here tonight. I bring with me, and it is being passed around, a petition signed by 184 AHS students and staff who support the opportunity to for a U.S. government politics class to be available. I have been speaking with Dr. Dunn, who is head of the history department, and she has presented me with two possible options for this course. The options are the standard U.S. AP U.S. Government and Politics course and the Syracuse University Dual Enrollment Alternative Public Policy class. The course descriptions are in the sheet of paper I passed out earlier, and I hope I got to everyone. If not, um, you can look on with a neighbor. <laughs> in short, the major difference in the curriculum between the public policy class and the AP United States Government class is that public policy focuses on, you guessed it, the policies of the government, what goes into making them, and how they affect people. The AP course is more general and dabbles in political theory as well. In terms of the nuts and bolts of the two courses, both are offered at the AP level. So in a transcript, they would both be weighted at the AP level. Students, if we offered the Syracuse University dual enrollment class, students would also receive a Syracuse University transcript at the end of the class with their grade on it, which, which could be offered um, to colleges that students are applying to. A new instructor would not be needed to teach this course, um, and it would be taught in person at Arlington High School, which is kind of misleading because of the name. Um, the teacher would be trained at Syracuse University for two weeks in the summer. Dr. Dunn has already recommended several very competent teachers who would be willing and able to teach this course, such as Mr. Fant, Mr. Sansonito, and Mr. Pei. Both courses would run for only one semester. There is a common misconception that the AP course would have to run for a full year, but that is only if it is being run alongside its sister course, the AP Comparative Government and Politics. However, I'm only proposing the one semester AP course or the one semester um, Syracuse University dual enrollment class. There is a slight cost difference between the two classes. The AP exam at the end of the AP course costs $95 as of this year, and the Syracuse University course costs 110. Dr. Dunn would like me to relate to you that she is very enthusiastic about offering either the AP government or the Syracuse University alternative, but she can only do this if she receives the increased staffing request that is currently in the budget proposal, which we'll talk about later this evening. During my meeting with her and some interested students yesterday afternoon, we discussed the pros and cons of both classes. The general consensus from the students at that meeting was that although the public policy class sounded interesting, the AP government course would be a better fit for our school due to its broader curriculum. We also agreed that the AP course might attract more students as its format is more familiar rather than the Syracuse University dual enrollment class. This also fit with the reactions I received from students outside the meeting. I have heard a lot of positive feedback in general, and I feel bound to report to you 
due to the sheer amount of feedback I received on one particular aspect of the subject um, that students would prefer Mr. Matson to teach that class, although <laughs> I know we don't have any control over that here. Dr. Dunn thought the reactions might be opposite for the staff and they might be leaning towards the public policy class that is that the new and cool thing to have in schools. Um, and even at this late date, literally 10 minutes before the program of studies is set to be approved here, there is still time to add this course. Mm -hmm. Although the course description would not be in the physical packet, um, a flyer could be easily attached and so students would receive the information at the same time. So there would be no like, late detriment and students wouldn't have time to sign up. Bottom line is, I truly believe that this class should be offered at Arlington High. It'd be one of the most relevant classes we could offer, exploring how the longest continuous form of government runs, occasionally doesn't, and what has kept it running for over 200 years. And every year, I'm amazed at the wide variety of classes we offer here at Arlington High, giving students the opportunity to expand their horizons with classes from economics to fashion and interior design. It would give students who are interested in going into the field of political science or who are just interested in how the government fits together the chance to learn about it. Because the Constitution is a living document, politics and government will never get old. America will always need a constant flow of new ideas and new minds, working to come up with new solutions to both new problems and old. And although I don't think that 184 students will sign up for the course, judging by how active our student government, Model Congress, and Model UN are, I think we will have more than the required 18 students to sign up for this course. And also judging by how many underclassmen are involved in at least the Model Congress, this course will have a long life here at Arlington High. Finally, in the proper lingo, I yield my time to questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, does any of the members, could any of them, questions? Ms. Hine? Um, you shared with us what the, what the um, students' preferred mm -hmm. course was, and you also shared with us what the staff's preferred course is. What's your preference? Well, I personally think that the public policy course is very interesting. However, it would be probably more to my advantage to take the AP government course and get a broader range to see how the government actually works and not just the policy parts of it. Thank you. Dr. Bode. It's possible to amend the, we have to have a motion to amend the program of studies to include both. How the high school works as many of you know, is it that the courses offered are entirely determined by student choice. Mm -hmm. So if both courses were offered, it would just depend on whether the number of students that signed up were um, sufficient to run the course. Good. And so then people could have their choice. There, the, the part with the, pro, the one for Syracuse, there is a, a piece of this we'd have to do, which we're willing to do is do the training as you know, we had a dual enrollment this year and we sent the teacher to Syracuse to have the training for the course. And um, our hope is over the next um, few years, and Dr. Janger has arrived, as well as our assistant principal, Bill McCarthy's been here, maybe they can talk a little bit about this as well. But our hope would be to have more opportunities, such as dual enrollment, so our students are leaving um, with some credits that they can use in college. but. Yeah. Perhaps even more importantly, though that's not a small issue, is that it really enhances their application to college. That they, in <coughs> high school, were able to take a college level course and do very well. So I, I, I applaud you, Ms. Stewart, for coming. You're very articulate, and, and mm -hmm. thank you for doing that. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if you want to ask Dr. Uh, Mr. Tillman? Well, yeah, I was going to build upon what Dr. Bodie said is that. I think we should, as a committee, acknowledge uh, the fact that 100, I don't know, how many, how many students signed up? 184. 184 students signed a petition asking <coughs> not for more lunch time, not for uh, <laughs> more free time, but not for, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> we were doing so well. <laughs> but, but for a course, an academic course, and an AP course uh, at that. So uh, congratulations for doing that. That, I think, says a lot. It says volumes about our students and about our high school. So um, I don't know. I think you know, it's a budget issue. It's a, we're, if, we can make, if we can accommodate this, we should. And if it's a simple thing of at least putting it in the handbook so it's an option for the school, is there, is there any reason why we wouldn't do that? 
I personally don't, but you could ask Principal Well, he Granger. works for you, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's already heard but I thought. So I just have a note on that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Dunn says the only way that this course could be offered is that if she receives the increased staffing. So that's if, if you approve it and it goes into the course of studies, that would be the only limitation for it to be you know, accepted I'm a, into the course. I'm a big believer in the superintendent getting involved in the school, so maybe she could. You want to teach the course? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> AP government. Mm -hmm. I'll co-teach it with you. No. Now, now we're talking. Okay, that'd be fun. <laughs> She's a licensed math teacher. Before I get to this time again, let me get to others who haven't. Mr. Hannon. Uh, just clarification, you mentioned about putting both in. Uh, what happens if we have students enough to sign up for both? Do we offer the both courses? We don't have it, the teachers. We don't have the teachers. It, That's it, my it, only concern. Um, we, do. we are looking for additional staffing in, in the history department. Right. And right now, there would be, if, if we did not have additional staffing, you're absolutely correct, it would be impossible to have more right. electives. Right. So the intent is to widen that because the electives in the high school, particularly in, in the history, are very large classes. So it's, again, it's run by student choice so that if both courses were to run, it would mean maybe another elective didn't have four sections, it had three sections. I see, I see. That makes sense. It, it, I, I'm for it. Don't misunderstand me. I, I'm all for it 100 percent. I, I just want to make it work. I don't want to have any kinks in. You've clarified that. Thank you. I, I might suggest maybe um, offering just one to start because um, you need 18 students to sign up and participate in the class in order to, for it to be an elective. And um, since it's such a new course that would be, un that would be offered, um, I wouldn't want to have students split so that there might be like 15 in one and 15 in another. Um, so if, if there is enough popularity, I think maybe adding both courses later on once it gains um, like respect, Traction. yeah, catch on, um, then that might be a possibility, but I would recommend starting with just one of the courses. Yeah. And uh, I want, want oh, my name, Caroline. Um, I know that within the student population, AP courses are very popular right now because they look so good on a college application as a senior. I know that it's, I wanted to have AP something my belt. So I think that offering the AP course first might be a better choice and then I know that the economics class that is also a Syracuse class is very popular also, but I think that the AP would be a better choice to start off. I think more students would sign up. Um, I'm really having a hard time though wrapping my head around the budget implications requiring additional staffing <coughs> because my understanding is most of our students have fully committed schedules. Mm -hmm. Um, the majority of our students do not have any gaps. If anything, we have children taking um, phys ed waivers so that they can take additional courses. So we have these, the majority of our students taking something like AP European History their senior year already. Mm -hmm. um, whoever the staff is for that, it seems like there would be a migration because some of our students wouldn't be able to take both APs and might choose this instead. And so um, perhaps, you know, because in my head, it, it feels like all we need is the professional development. Dr. Jenner, would you, would you like to take the mic on? Yeah. Uh, I've got a loud voice. Okay. No, oh, no, no, it, no, it doesn't extend out to East Arlington. No, I mean, all I was going to say was there are a number of places where we have floated additional courses, and the real decision about whether you can offer them then comes after we look at signups and we look at how many teachers we have. Um, right now, we're asking for new social studies staff because our AP classes in particular are large. Um, so the idea that we might float something like this and see what kind of signups we get um, seems perfectly reasonable. And then if we were actually going to be able to run it, would really depend on if we get the additional staffing we're requesting, that makes it more likely that we're able to do it. And then it really depends on how it shakes out. Does it pull from other classes? We don't know. Um, does it end up being an additional class? There are some students whose schedules are over full, um, and there are also a lot of students with gaps in their schedules. Would those students choose, are those students that have the gaps in their schedules ones that are going to choose to take an AP class? It's just something we don't know. Um, I think one way or another, it sounds like something we can offer, certainly at least the after school or dual enrollment option is something that's easier to do. Um, I think what I hear when I hear the students asking for this is one more case for why it really 
is valuable for us to make that case for the additional social studies staff. We don't have um, a lot of social studies electives, and students would take them, all kinds of electives. So, um, If I could just repeat back a little bit of what I think I heard. I think what you're telling me, though, is whether or not we have this course, we need the additional staffing. Correct. And so, once again, my point is, I'm viewing this as a wash because we need the staff to accommodate our student body currently with the current course offerings. This doesn't negate or add to that staffing need. Correct. Well, yes, what it might do, it's really hard to, I and mean, the honest truth is, I've done this before, like you go through and you have a certain number of sections and you have a certain number of sections kids have signed up for and you'd make this decision, you know, do we squeeze 30 into AP this so that we can have a section of this that's only got 18 or do we cut the section of 18 and in order to make the sections of the AP classes be 25, you know, it's that sort of decision that we have to make as we go through. Right now we're very tight. So if you were to ask us to add an additional social studies class now, the likelihood is unless it was really bleeding kids off other classes, we would be in a situation where we couldn't run things we wanted to run. With the additional staffing, it's hard to tell. It's more likely that we'll be able to do it, but we don't know until we run it. And once again, what's the average size for AP social studies classes? Very high. Very high. Um, 30s. I, I, I was thinking yeah. 30s, but. I mean, the, what we've done is made that decision to make those classes up in the 30 area so that we can continue to run the other classes. And, and that's really in terms of the level of writing that students are expected to do and the um, amount of staff feedback we want to give the children as they're preparing for their AP exams, that's far from an optimal ratio to begin with. Correct. It puts a huge burden on the teachers and it cuts back on the amount of writing the kids are doing and the amount of feedback they're getting. Okay. Thank you for addressing those questions. Mr. Uh, I, I think in terms of just you know, reading the course descriptions, and listening to the discussion of, of why we were moving toward the Syracuse program uh, last year, I think that my preference going forward strategically would be to add the Syracuse. Uh, it, the description looks more case study oriented and, uh, and, and I think would be a more substantive course by design. Uh, but I, having scheduled a high school myself, I can see what Ms. Ms. Hyam is saying, that if all of a sudden we got a bunch of kids signing up for this, uh, those bodies are going in that direction so that, you know, as we make the staffing decisions down the road, we may need one more social studies teacher, we may need one less teacher or something else because people are flowing to these particular electives. So that whether we're offering 15 sections of social studies and X number of sections of everything else or 12 sections of social studies and X plus three of everything else. That, in theory, should be a wash. So I'm not looking upon this as a budgetary decision. But I am looking upon this as a policy decision for us. And this is an exercise in public policy as to where we want to take the curriculum of the high school. So that uh, in an ideal world, I'd be looking at adding the Syracuse course in my mind, to the course catalog. Uh, if it adds knowledge to you and helps you make a decision of what to do, you know, I would go along with putting both in, but I, I'd rather be going the route of offering the college credit courses than doing the AP courses. I believe that if you were using that as the criteria, probably the dual enrollment would would be a, a little bit have a little bit more cachet in a resume to college. 
My suggestion here is that th this is not the place to decide really which of the two courses. That I would suggest um, amending the program of studies to, uh, to potentially offer both mm -hmm. and give it back to the high school um, with administration to decide if they want to offer both this year or stagger it. At least it's approved and then they could then maybe start one course this year or another. The thing about the dual enrollment though that that may may or may not uh, make it possible this year is that the faculty member who teaches it actually has to go mm -hmm. over the summer and do the training. And I, I'm not sure that we have commit, uh, com uh, a commitment on that part. Mm -hmm. Um, so it may, but I don't know. I have a couple of points of information. Um, like you were saying, so I was talking to Dr. or Mrs. Dunn about this, and there is about a 90% acceptance rate for colleges accepting the three credit um, Syracuse University course. However, the thing that she was concerned about uh, is that there's not really, um, like it wouldn't really get you out of like say if you're going into a political science major, like American Government 101, because it's a separate thing from the AP course. And yes, it is harder to get those AP credits um, accepted, especially if you're looking to go into um, a top tier school. But if you do get that chance to, it would like get you out of those basic courses, whereas the public policy might not fit as well. Mm -hmm. What is the training requirement for a teacher if we establish a new AP course? There's training for that as well. Um, I, I forget how much time there's involved with the Syracuse um, course. Weeks in Syracuse yeah. and generally one, one week, week for the, for the AP. AP. Mm -hmm. The, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the training for AP is not required, but the, the approval of the syllabus mm -hmm. by the College Board is required. So. The, the training is recommended for the AP class, but it's not required. Many people think it's required, but it's actually not required to teach the class. However, the syllabus has to be, and many times people want to go for the training because it helps them to develop a syllabus that will be approved. Okay, a few more quick comments or questions, and then I'd like to hear a motion. Dr. Allison. Okay, first, um, thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Second, I'd like some clarity on the budgetary things. I understand that it could be a wash, but it could also pull from other electives, non-social study related. And I'm wondering when there's talk about need of additional staffing, is that included in the budget that we'll be discussing later, or is that in addition to what's already built into this budget? It's, in, it's already in the proposed budget. The thing I would say about the high school is that even though we might say 0.6 for that department, 0.4 for that department, really the final choice comes after students select courses. So it, there may be some changes in that. So it would actually be probably better to think about it as a high school number of FTEs for the high school, which will be determined by student choice. But Dr. Janger, would you agree with that? Mm -hmm those FTEs are built into the yes. budget. They're, okay, that's, yes. that's what mm -hmm. I want to know. Okay. Well, that's really Carolyn. Um, you said it would be for month and one, correct? Yep, one semester. So would it be possible to offer both and just have one semester and then one semester mm -hmm. and the same teacher teach both classes? If they're going to. Again, I would, I would suggest mm -hmm. that the high school mm -hmm. handle this as a yes. possibility and, and consider both. Concept. Make a motion. I guess I would go back to the question if this is a policy <laughs> question. For this committee, it's yep. really do we mm -hmm. put in the program of studies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, mm -hmm. and, then, and then we're still stuck in the same decision making process that mm -hmm. we're always in, which is how many kids sign up, mm -hmm. how can we staff it, which staffing is it going to be? <clears throat> There's sort of challenge now just that it's come a little late in the game, which isn't their fault. Nobody realizes yet until they can decide to amend their report. Us. Um, you know, is that there are some pieces of legwork in terms of who would teach it and getting training that we haven't entirely done. I would be inclined, I mean, I support it being put in the program of studies, and then it's something that's out there, it's something we can offer. We might not be able to offer it, we might not be able to offer both, it would depend on student interest. Mm -hmm. well, you would we'll just figure out how to poll people on the assignment process. To clarify, you would support putting both courses in the program of studies? I think at this point we don't really know. So put them both in? Put them both in. Okay. It may, I mean, we can decide to put them both in and say, well, we're not offering that. And that's mm -hmm. something we can do. If it's not in there, we have to come back to you guys again. Mr. Andrew? 
I move that we put both these programs into the course of study. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, 7 0. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We should clap for her. Yeah, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> Can I make well yeah, Mr. Hainer has one. Uh, Emma, I'd just like to say this is your first victory in public policy. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's not because I already passed a proclamation through the Board of Selectmen. So. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the proclamations have no standing, whereas this, <laughs> this is a decision. They're good at that sort of thing. Yeah, kind of proclamation. Future politicians. Yeah. Some of the comments on these signature sheets are great. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I know. Full year. You could, you could probably notice the one that was Center Online History class, which is just pretty much all the comments that was napkin with various numbers of exclamation points afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of enthusiasm for it. Great. Does she want those back? Um, all right, moving on. Our next item on the agenda is uh, for approval of the Arlington High School Program of Studies. Um, we have Mr. McCarthy and Dr. Janger. Yeah, back up, back up. Back up. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, for the purposes of discussion, I move that we accept the uh, Arlington High School uh, course of study. Second. Second. Okay. The floor is yours, John. <laughs> I'm sorry, supposed to say something? Uh, I don't know. Is like this accept or approve? approve? Well, no, now we're just, we're just accepting it. We just it. moved it. We just so. moved it to okay. We didn't vote it. Why do we need to do that? Well, discussion on it. Now we're going to discuss it. <laughs> Go ahead. Do, 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 well, should I open it up to the members for any questions? To I mean, we could do we could do highlights of some of the changes, but um, it's yeah, not particularly complicated. Um, I'm just going to try to remember off the top of my head. Do you want to do it? I can do it. So um, what's going on right now is a packet. It contains the first uh, 20 pages, uh, 20 or 19, I believe, uh, which contain a majority of the changes that we have made. Uh, actually, I should say almost all of the changes that we've made. Uh, the two that I would like to draw your attention to are on page 6, which are, states the policy for online coursework and dual enrollment coursework. Uh, as you know, at the high school, we offer several courses online and, and through dual enrollment, much as we just talked about with the Syracuse University. We just wanted to put a policy in place to help clarify what those courses are, how they would be created, and who would approve them. Uh, in addition, we have uh, pages 15 through 19 are the new courses that we'll be offering at the high school. Uh, as Dr. Jenger pointed out previously, we do put these courses out. We see if there is interest. If there is interest, we do run them. If there is not interest, we do not run them. Um, we are excited with a lot of these new courses. We have courses in world language, mathematics, um, consumer, family and consumer sciences, uh, introduction to wood tech will be making a return, uh, and there will be several new offerings in PE. I didn't know if there were any questions about any of the new courses. I know there was a question earlier. Uh, we will not be eliminating any courses from last year's syllabus at this time. We are going to wait and see what the enrollment will be this year in terms of student requests for courses. Any questions, comments? Okay. Well, we, we, we had a motion for discussion. Right. Should, we, should we vote that? Is that what you're looking at, Mr. Angeli, for? No. Uh, no, we don't need to. No, not until the end of it. Dr. Allison Ampey, question. I'm confused what the motion on the floor is. Excuse me. I thought I voted to approve it for the for the pr I stated for the purposes of discussion I, I mo made a motion to approve it. You said accept. I'll I approve. Approve, but that's mm -hmm. okay. Anyway, I, okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I still don't understand the motion. We're on just the discussing court. this. Mm -hmm. just okay. The motion is to accept this. We just said to, to, to approve, approve it. Approve. Fine. Do you want, do you want to withdraw? I, I, no, just talk about okay. it. Just okay. I have a question, Mr. Hanner. You mentioned that these are the add-ons. Have we uh, eliminated any of the courses from last year's uh, course of studies? You said no. I apologize. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. Sorry. Bad student. What, do, what does happen is once we do student requests and review them, if a course does not have enough students requesting it in order to run it, we do eliminate it. 
Okay. Uh, are there any other changes within the document vis-a-vis -vis last year besides the addition of the courses? The dual enrollment policy, mm -hmm. and there's also a change in the language around um, the meaning of grades, not the actual nature of grades. Uh, where's that? Uh, just a moment, I'll look that up for you. Um, what the language sh has shifted from is the l old language was a fairly, it's on page nine, mm -hmm. was a, a combination of traditional language from the, if, if you think about the way we've often talked about grades, grades, one of the old versions from uh, the early days of the creation of the whole Carnegie system was that, you know, uh, A's were excellent top 5%, B's, they're t these are two different things. A's were excellent, B's were good, um, C's were fair or average, and then D's were poor and E's were fail. Those, some of those were versions of language, some of those were based on an assumption of a normal distribution of grades. Um, the practice of grading in the United States in high schools at this point generally doesn't follow that approach at all. And the language that we shifted to is a more proficiency based. It's still the same grading system, but the idea is to focus on our people mastering the expectations and standards for the course. So an A talks about students who are doing superior work um, that they exceed the standard for the course, B is meeting the standard for the course, um, C and D are partially meeting the standards for the course, and then F is still failing. The idea is to move it into language that's more consistent with a standards-based approach, since that's the structure of the classes in terms of common assessments and standards that are being put out there. It, it's not something which I would expect will cause anybody's grades to actually change suddenly in terms of the grading practices that teachers do. Um, there's a whole different range of the ways that teachers engage in their teaching practices, but the idea is to have that language move in that direction to start that conversation. There, oh, sorry. There was one other slight change. Um, on page, page four, under promotion and graduation, MCAS competency determination, um, over the years, as MCAS has changed, the wording in that paragraph was continually added to. I just tidied that up so it was a little clearer in terms of what the expectations are. Sorry. Ms. Burke? Um, I have a couple questions. One is, um, how does one, uh, un have the graduation requirements changed at all? No. There is language that is slightly different under world language. Mm -hmm. um, which the world language requirement is still two years of world language. Since our universities, the state universities, expect are asking for two to three years of language, usually in the same language, um, we've added an expectation that if a student chooses not to pursue two years of the same language, that has to be approved by me and the world language teacher. Um, we didn't want to change it as a seat time requirement because it really that, that doesn't really move us in the direction we want to move in, but we did want to make sure that no student was making that without a very clear understanding that if they were going to meet the state minimum standard two years of two different languages, that that was going to hamper them if they wanted to go on some post and secondary options. Okay. Um, how does a student demonstrate competency in computer technology? <laughs> I'm going to leave that one to Bill. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can give you a, a bit of a hand-waving answer, but I'm going to let Bill take a shot at it. Thank you, Dr. Jenger. Um, so in most of our classes, uh, if not actually at this stage, I should say all of our classes, there are computer, co um, computer requirements uh, in terms of word processing, online searching. Um, you'd be difficult to find a syllabus in our school that does not have some component of computer usage, including PE. And so that, that is used as a determinant. So it's embedded in the classroom standards and expectations. Okay. Um, and can someone talk to me about why we require one year of fine arts as a parent of a student who has not yet met that requirement and has taken numerous technology classes and is now freaking out because he doesn't have any fine arts? So I just want to understand better. Why do we require a year of fine arts? Well, I, because there are lots of kids for whom... I guess if you ask me that question, I can, make an, I can make an argument as to why I feel that would be a valuable standard, but the expectation is one that was set by um, 
the school committee in the past, not by me, so I don't know what the rationale was by which they got there. I would say I think it's a good idea to make sure those standards are covered. Okay, I if I remember correctly, it used to say that you had to have one year of fine arts or performing arts. So fine arts, um, the way that our program of studies, at least my understanding of it is, is that fine arts does include performing arts. Okay. Um, so we do offer a wide array of courses ranging everything from um, art of the cinema, where students review uh, great works of art in cinema, uh, to art that they produce, and I believe now, and correct me if I'm wrong, does Woodshop fall under that? It does not. It does not, thank you. That was it's, a discussion. A, it's a new course, so we didn't put that in there. What is that? it? Uh, it Woodshop. was Woodshop, oh, whether or not Woodshop would fall under that, but it was a discussion we had. We decided not to do it at this stage because it is a new course. Now, the, the rationale for a fine arts credit is the class has to be primarily focused on an aesthetic um, performance. So family and consumer science classes don't there have been some in the past that have that have been for example I believe the fashion class did um, but there was a discussion about the woodshop the current standards of the woodshop class are not focused on production of art or aesthetic material outcomes or aesthetic appreciation they're focused on being able to use the tools and make stuff um, so it wouldn't meet that standard we actually have a some language proposed that's in, a, in an envelope that we thought about putting in there as sort of guidelines on how we would come up with that standard, but it didn't seem like something that was necessary to be in there. It seemed helpful as a guideline for us to have. Okay. In my current class, we're actually doing debates, and one of the topics being debated is whether art and music should be part of education. And statistically, the person who was presenting it said, gave listed off statistics that show that art and music and having that component in your learning is actually very beneficial to the learning process. And as someone who has personally taken the fine arts requirement, it was, and I actually like prefer the sciences as well, and I've taken a lot more sciences courses since I've filled my requirement, but it kind of, I took drama and it kind of forced me to step out of my comfort zone in a healthy way and it helped me um, to publicly speak better. And it, Fine arts, I think, is a nice break in the day to give yourself to just be creative for a little bit, and I think it's very important as part of the graduation requirements. Thank you. Well said. Mr. Schlicker. Well, we're getting into a couple things here. First of all, on page nine, the letter, yeah, I, I, the letter grade expectations. First of all, the text that's online, because I pulled up the version online, and the draft that you handed us has a paragraph needs to be reviewed see Matt's comments on the right no yes. oh that is that a comment on the side no no it's it's on oh, it's, right it's, there. it's, it's, it's in bold print in the heading <laughs> you know um, that's actually really important we have to leave that in there that's <laughs> <laughs> so what were Matt's comments on the right that will comment on everyone's grades <laughs> Okay. Well, that's nice. Actually, what it what was actually there that was what was written when it had the old language, and I had written that language in the comment box. Okay. I, I like the the rubric discussion. I don't like the fair work for the C kind of thing. I'd almost like to get the the old language out of the first letters, but that's beyond that. But the thing, that, you know, I, I've, I've got to say I'm a little frustrated in that on the 14th uh, we did ask for an annotated version detailing all the changes and now we've got the changes in the courses and then it's oh yeah and we change this and then oh yeah then we change uh, a paragraph on page 9 rel uh, relative to the uh, requirements for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for world language. Uh, commentary, yes. Yeah, so, it, it, but you know, the thing that it, it is a policy document. It's, it's important for us to know exactly where the changes are being made as, as a committee. And and I and I have to say, I'm feeling a little frustrated here because I, I don't feel like I've got a, a handle on everything that's the, the, the all the moving pieces. Dr. Allison, this is probably my fault. Um, I may have missed a ball which 
was tossed mm -hmm. to me and I didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. the, com the document which we received what did have track changes, but it was not actually intended to be disseminated publicly. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't, and, and it had commentary as opposed to changes. It was a working, work in progress. It wasn't a, mm -hmm. this is new, this is old. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I didn't forward it to you. Um, I didn't think to prepare or to ask to have prepared a separate document which just outlined things. Part of it is that there was also a fair amount of discussion of just cleaning up the text and moving things around without actually changing it and how that would be conveyed um, is a little bit was confusing to me. So I apologize that you didn't get what you thought you should have. Um, next time I'll know better. Um, we did have a fairly substantial discussion at our meeting um, and uh, felt there, we left it that there were still edits more, uh, again, more for language and, and for fluidity than for um, anything that's changing, making differences in policy. And we left that the committee all voted to move that the handbook be approved um, as presented by Dr. Janger. Um, and, you know, next time we need to clarify a little bit who's bringing the track, the, the changes, and, and make sure that that comes. Um. All right, any further discussion? Ms. Hine. Um, I just wanted to bring up two points, and it's revisiting mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the graduation requirements on page four. Um, first of all, the fine arts piece. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that has to be in there. I mm -hmm. because I have an equal number of students that I've heard say, "I'll never take, I'll never need my physics course again once I leave." Mm -hmm. You know, and and this mm -hmm. is a whole child education type of philosophy, and you really. So I do feel that what we have here is reflective of the idea that we're educating children not just for college acceptance, but also for citizenship. Um, the second piece is in the past, um, item number 10, perform a document 40 hours of community service. Um, we did hear that there have been times where that has been a more challenging piece for the faculty at the high school to actually check into and monitor. Um, is it still reasonable that that is being appropriately supervised to actually count as a legitimate um, graduation requirement? I would say that it is. Um, currently what we do have, um, the 40 hours is completed over the course of four years. The system we have in place is that any student who does community service uh, has a form that <coughs> must be signed off by an adult that they did the community service with. Uh, that form is stored in guidance. Uh, our guidance <coughs> secretary tracks all of the hours. If there ever is something that is questionable, the contact information for the person who did the community service, who signed off on it, um, is available and we can call them. Uh, <coughs> oftentimes our students do community service uh, around the building and through the school, so it's not something that we need to check up on if they're doing something, say for instance, junior community service day. Students will do three or four hours through that. <coughs> it's a blanket statement, I sign off. The student who was there gets the form. Uh, but we do, I, I do feel that we do have a good system of tracking it. Is it perfect? No. But I, I do believe that when there is something questionable, we can catch it. And then on page nine, um, back to the, the descriptions of what um, the different letter grades mean. Um, on one hand, I'm very happy to see this language because it does. Um, mm -hmm. It comments more on the level of competency and less on some mm -hmm. nebulous ideal. Uh, but I do wonder if we're um, basically creating a system for grade inflation with these new definitions, mm. with the B as proficient. Not that I don't want my child, <laughs> to, you know, I don't want you to go in and feel like you have to change her grades to prove this, but, um, but you know, that definition between what is <coughs> traditionally meant and what a B traditionally meant and whether, whether we need to actually think, you know, what is reflective of that differentiation and, and also from a high B to a low A. 
where is that line between proficiency and superior? Um, is, it, is it a quantity? Is there a qualitative component that is really being looked for? Um, just to really differentiate that to another level. And you know, it's um, being a very concrete person for me, I would love to see that go one more step. But um, this definitely, from my perspective, shows a step in the right direction mm -hmm. where I feel like children in New Arlington High School get a much more rigorous education than a lot of other places. A be here to me is much more meaningful than be in other systems because knowing that caliber, of the expectations, what their peers are doing and what it takes to mean superior or proficient in relation, you know, I, I do feel like we have a lot of very deserving students that are getting appropriate grades. But I don't feel like this really teases it out as much. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to call the vote if that's all right with the members. Okay, <coughs> all those in favor of approving the Arlington High School Program of Studies 2014-2015 say aye. 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 All those against? Abstain. Okay. One abstention. Oh, one abstention. Does that count? Yes, I do. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. Mm -hmm. Did we get the hand? Slotty Campbell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Slotty Campbell. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Janger, we need you just one more time. Mm -hmm. You could, Mr. McCarthy, you could <laughs> stay up as well. This is the Arlington High School Athletic Handbook for 2014 2000. Uh, 15, right? So we want to right change <coughs> change the 13 to this this part. Oh, is that wrong? <laughs> yeah. um, no, actually, I think no. it's for this year. It's for, it's oh, it's for start. this year. It is. Yes. Okay. It's for yes. this coming in. It's this year that we're in right now. Uh -huh. Yes. We're yes. proving. And yes, this. We is didn't have one before, so it was started to be drafted at the beginning of this oh, year. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So CIA also um, reviewed and discussed this actually at greater length. Okay. Um, and yes, it is intended for this year. There was not, um, Ms. Dugluck, um the athletic director had looked through all their files and there has been nothing in multiple years going backwards. So she created it from scratch. Um, there were a few things that we asked to have changed um, we worked with town council to come up with a, a phrasing for fund for the uh, uh, discussion of fundraising, um, and what were the other things that we wanted to fix? Anyway, oh, we added references to made sure that there were explicit references to hazing and bullying policies, um, and uh, the after these changes, the CA. Um, moved that the school committee approved this handbook as presented. Thank you. Um, can I have a motion to approve the Arlington Athletics Handbook? I so move. So move. Yeah. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion. Mr. Hanner? Again, this may be the old man not paying attention, but will this be the handbook for the subsequent year as well? I, I would hope so. Thank you. Any further discussion, questions for Dr. Janger? Do you have any understanding as to why we didn't have one of these before? I mean, I'm just curious. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you read through this, an awful lot of this um, are policies that existed in other places. Yeah. It's reiterations of MIA policies that are known. Um, so some of this is just conveniently putting it all together in one place. Okay. I will, I will say, having coached in Arlington for, for many years, um, the coaches often receive a packet that contains many of these forms, but as Matt said, or Dr. Janger said, it's a chance to put them all in one spot. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and we commended and the athletic director for taking this on. We, we thought it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. So this will go to all athletes or all students? It would go to all athletes. All athletes. But it will be available online for all students to access. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, that passes 7 0. Thank you both very much. Wow, well, they're, well. they're both here. It's actually my superintendent's report, but um, I've been working very closely um, with both Mr. McCarthy and Dr. Janger on the upcoming presentations of the report 
that we have um, we've been working with an architect on the programmatic needs of the high school and as you know next week you're going to hear that report um, Board of Selectmen have been requested to put us on the agenda on March 10th but we are also going to have a forum for parents and community members on Wednesday March 12th from 7 to 8 maybe it'd be 8 15 um, but in addition to that we're going to have a uh, tours of the building and we've been working on the dates and the times for that and this will all be on our website and this will be also be sent out to parents and hopefully even um, we'll ask perhaps one of the town meeting members on the committee here to forward it to town meeting members but we're going to have three opportunities for tours of the high school and uh, I'll let them talk a little bit about who are going to be the tour leaders but the first, um, the first tour is going to be on Saturday morning, March 15th, and that will be from 9.30 to 11. Then there will be two late afternoon uh, tours the following week, on Tuesday the 18th, 4 to 5.30, and then Thursday the 20th of March, 4 to 5.30. In, for all three of these, we would like people to RSVP so we know how many people are coming and just to figure out the groups and, and number of people that are going to be helping. But what I thought that they could talk a little bit about is the building committee that exists um, in the high school and their role on this in the tours. So I'm going to have to go in about two minutes because unfortunately the hockey drop off didn't work and my kid is waiting downstairs. Um, but I apologize for that. Um, we have got, we have had since the beginning of the year a group called the Future Building Committee. It's an intentional pun. Um, the idea being that we would be building the future and talking about the future of the building. Um, and that group is a representative committee from all the departments. Um, and we've been looking both at the vision of what instruction would look like in a future building and then also looking at what we would be interested in having in a building in the future. Um, so that group will be trained to, they'll go around on the same tour that most of you have been on, I think all of you have been on, um, and then they would be the tour leaders. Um, we're also, just while we're here mentioning, um, we're also scheduled to go off and visit in the not too distant future a couple of other high schools to look at their building projects and the things that they found in their schools. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hale? Could I ask the superintendent to pass on all those dates and times uh, to the committee? Oh, I'm, I'm going to, Great. absolutely. We're gonna disseminate this as widely as we can. How can, right. how can folks RSVP? Uh, we haven't told her yet, but um, Ann Albertazzi, who is the secretary uh, to the principal, is going to be the person, and uh, that will be on the notification as well. Great. Hope she's not listening before we tell her. No, and, and I will, one of the ways, I mean, I will also send it out as a form so that folks can digitally do that as well. Great. Hopefully that'll save her some phone calls. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. I Very apologize good. for running out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, just a little back up on behind five minutes. Um, Mr. Bill Downing is here with us to discuss a Warren article um, for the annual special town meeting. Uh, this is to propose an elimination of fees for extracurricular activities. And, uh, good evening, Mr. Downing. Hi. Thank you for putting me on the Thank agenda. You for coming. Um, I'd like to talk about the Warren article that I filed to eliminate fees for extracurricular activities, which are elementary instrumental music and high school athletics. A child's family has to pay $435 to play an instrument. I feel this fee is prohibitively high for one child, never mind if the family has two or more children who would like to learn an instrument. If the price were halved, it would still be difficult for most families to afford. As for high school athletics, Arlington's fees are some of the highest in the state. On the board is a spreadsheet of high school athletic fees with line one displaying Arlington's fees. The second line is the league average for the sport. And the third line is the percentage difference between them. If you read across to football, Arlington is 183% higher. Golf, 81% higher. 
soccer, 45%, basketball, 74%, gymnastics, 249%, hockey, 222%, baseball, 74%, and softball is 74% higher than league average. I think the very least we can do is lower our fees to be more in line with league averages. The money to sustain this can be found in the new base for Chapter 70 state aid. We received between $1.3 and $1.5 million for full day kindergarten. And it cost the school department approximately $950,000. This would make available up to $450,000 to finance <coughs> music and sports. Young families are getting hammered by these fees, and I don't think that this is fair. So, the parents and children of Arlington are asking for your support in town meeting to pass this article. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Downing from the committee? Comments? Ms. Starks? Um, have you met with the town manager? Have you had I, a chance to meet with him yet? I haven't, no. Um, I know that uh, the um, finance committee unanimously voted against this. Just they so did. you know. <laughs> they voted no action. Yes. No action. So, um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, we are in a tough predicament. I think that everyone on this committee would probably agree with you that we would rather have no fees. At the very least, we would love to have much less fees. Um, unfortunately, we don't have all the money to do everything we want. And you also know that our agreement with the town is a fairly... Uh, trying to think of the complex. right word. Complex, exactly. Uh, complex one, and having just uh, gone to them and asked them for uh, a significant amount of money to help us uh, and making sure that that worked into the town uh, long-term plan um, makes it very hard without understanding how this would impact the long-term plan uh, to kind of vote for it. So I just want you to understand that's unfortunately the predicament that we are in. Um, so unless I know from the town manager that he can fund this without any um, detriment to the long-term planning for the town, unfortunately, even I can't be for it. Well, I mean, what you're saying is there's a ripple effect to this decision, right? Mr. Yes. Mr. Slickman. I'm intrigued by this, um, and I, I think you're part of the way down a road that that I think we probably should think about. Um, the one thing I noted, I, I, I agree with you 100%, the athletic fees are way too high, and, and the music fees are way too high. Um, and how, how to fix that, there's no easy answer, because if we were to just go within our budget and and, and eliminate the fees, then we've got to make cuts elsewhere in the budget. And with the increase in enrollment and the increase in class sizes we have in the district, that, that would have a detrimental impact in another world. Back in 1993, when we started with the foundation budget, this was included in the foundation budget, and we weren't charging a fee. The, the issue was is that as the foundation budget evolved, and this is used to calculate state aid and, and expenditures, uh, it hasn't inflated to keep, tra uh, uh, keep pace with the, the actual cost of delivering the service, which is why we and every other school committee around the state have been making cuts going for overrides and uh, instituting fees for all sorts of things that were never conceived of uh, when ad reform was instituted. Now, that said, I, I think that you're starting down the road an interesting idea because if we were to do an override specifically for this purpose that would freeze that amount of money as a dedicated expenditure out of the out of the levy and that would inflate by two and a half percent a year so that if the voters of the town decided that they looked at the subject of athletic and user fees and they wanted to do away with it and voted to do that within the context of a specific override for that purpose, we could get rid of the fees forever. 
because we would be legally bound to, de uh, to de dedicate that stream of our levy to the purpose for which they passed the override. Uh, the fatal flaw, in, and I'm, I'm a town meeting member, and that's a different argument for me there in, in what to do as a town meeting member, which is where the decision will be made. But I think the fatal flaw here is even if we do this as a one-time expenditure, we're right back where we were next year, uh, trying to balance the town budget and the school budget. But I, I think that that's uh, looking upon this as having a conversation with the town and town meeting as a town, exclusive of every, everything else, would we want to do an override for the cost of running our athletic programs to pass that around to the entire population and not to the parents of the children in the program? That's something that I would certainly vote for both on the floor of town meeting and the ballot. So. Um, I don't know where town meeting is going to go with it this year, but I, I'm really very appreciative of your efforts on this, and I think that there are ways to move this forward, even if it's not successful this year. Thank you. Ms. Heim. Mr. Um, just two points. You know, in an ideal world, mm -hmm. I would love public education to be free. I really, you know, I would love to have a system where every extracurricular had no value, no cost. We could have all our students mm -hmm. taking AP classes and we could cover the $95 a pop that those parents are paying. Mm -hmm. There are unfortunately what we're given by the state and as mm -hmm. generous as our town is with education, we can't fully fund. We cannot fully fund everything and we do have mm -hmm. a very delicate balance. Um, when I looked at your breakdown and this was something that I actually had the headache of kind of going through years ago when we were first examining the fee structure. Um, at that time, this town's commitment was, instead of looking towards flat fees across the board, that we didn't want um, our cross-country team that pretty much was not necessarily having to pay any sort of additional fees for rental spaces, was not having to have extra equipment, to have to bear the burden of um, I'll use the team my child was up briefly on the, the gymnastics team that needed other types of things. And so at that time, consensus was that a graduate structure where we actually looked at the costs per sport mm -hmm. was the most equitable way of doing this. And so it was directly user based. Um, and, you know, conversely, on your chart, you brought out the different sports that were above mm -hmm. the average. When you look at cheering, cross country, field hockey, volleyball, track, wrestling, lacrosse, mm -hmm. we're below. So, so we tried. We tried to have some equity in terms of setting this up. We made an agreement with the town in terms of wanting to still have the school department mm -hmm. decide how school funding occurred and not have that division. So while I'm always very grateful for people that are trying to actually make free public education free and public again. Um, I, I really feel like this kind of goes against some of what the work of this committee has been to try and make sure we provided the baseline of competent, high quality education for the actual high school requirements. Mm -hmm. So I, I just have to say that. So that being said, um, cheerleading actually looks like a bargain. We're um, below by 39%. However, if you put in the choreography charge, it was an extra $200. So cheerleading actually was about $300 this year. And we're, that puts us 34% higher than the league. I didn't put it in because it's, it's, I didn't want to screw the numbers like that. Now, I know about that because I paid it. Now. I don't know what else is involved, but it's not like you pay uh, uh, the 250 for soccer and that's that's it. You're done. You're still fundraising. You're still mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. doing all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for some sports. of the prices, you know, um, yeah. For the price of football, you should, Bill Belichick should be coaching this team. <laughs> <laughs> and just so you know, when we did these rubrics, we actually looked at the number of coaches per student ratio. We looked at um, whether there were additional fees we had to pay, such as green fees for golf, such as um, rink time, things like that, transportation. So it's not perfect. We, at that time, the cheerleading choreography piece, we were told that the, um, 
the cheerleading parents council did not, that was not part of the base. And so that has always been done separately through their fundraising mechanism. So, so you're right, it's not exactly true, but in terms of what our coaches and our space costs are, it's pretty. I, I understand that what the constraints you are under. Mr. Hand. In, going on with what we said, when the override was passed, we made a commitment, we the, the, the committee, uh, to stay within the constraints, the percentages and stuff. But at that time, the kindergarten fee was still in existence. Mm -hmm. And it was, that was not a part of the formula. Mm -hmm. And as such, when that kindergarten fee was changed, eliminated, it brought in an additional 1.3 to 1.5 million dollars mm -hmm. of added chapter 70 money. Mm -hmm. This is my opinion. The town has taken what originally was a, uh, a time and pushed it further forward and forward. Every additional cent that comes in to this town seems to expand that. To quote Mr. Lyons, a former member, uh, person in this town who took issue with the town the last time, they kept pushing things forward and forward and not dealing with it. The Chapter 70 money comes to the town. We take what the town gives us. I just want to say that more and more money comes in. There's an additional approximately $400,000 to $500,000 that comes in annually that was not part of that formula originally. I'm not asking the town to give it all, but maybe a little bit more of it now and then. Dr. Ellison. Okay. Um, I'm going to hit on a few different things. First, um, we were aware that there were the extra costs for some sports, and we put in a request to the then athletic director to give us information, and I don't believe we ever got that information. And we were concerned going forward that there was equity in the sports, and I hope with the new athletic director that this is something that can be addressed maybe in the next year that there are these costs that you know you're paying here and then you're also paying over here and it it shouldn't be that way um, and um, then talking about the agreement with the town first I wanted to make sure everyone understands in our viewing audience that we did go to the town this year for our increased unexpected enrollment and we are going to be getting an additional eight hundred and eighty five thousand dollars because we have too many students to to teach with the amount of money that we had before mm -hmm. um, I can't support asking for an additional four hundred thousand on top of this eight hundred and eighty five thousand because the, t the money doesn't just come from the town. The money comes from us. It comes from us as taxpayers or my neighbor who is a retiree and widow, and she's paying property tax. Um, this is, in my mind, ultimately a Massachusetts flaw, that, are, and part of it is the way that, that things have been set up, that too much of the burden of our schools are coming now down to property tax. And that's, for us, the only place we can pretty much raise money, although Chapter 70 brings in some. So anything we ask the town to give us, the town's going to be coming back in a year earlier to say, you've got to pay us more taxes. And I don't want to do that to my neighbor. I don't want to do I, that to your neighbors. I, I and so that's, that's where I just, I don't either. But, I appreciate you know, we're, the we're thought. Pu we're but pushing off an override mm -hmm. year after year. And all as I'm saying is that maybe a little bit of that $885,000 could have been put towards these fees. Um, maybe a little bit of that money that the, the town is salting away to push off overrides could be put towards these fees. And maybe they don't get eliminated. But maybe they're in line with league averages, and God forbid, a little lower. That's all I'm asking. I okay. Uh, okay. Any other comments? I'm not looking for an override. Can I? One thing I can't do this off the top of my head, but just looking at the league, there are many towns in the league that I know have significantly higher per capita incomes in their town and right. I think that also have significantly higher 
per pupil income or per pupil spending that goes to their schools. And we're trying, Arlington is historically a town that has done a whole lot with not so much. And the schools also do a whole lot with not so much, but we're, we're it's difficult to do. And this is, the fees have been one of the make do's that we've done. I'm not here complaining mm -hmm. about what you do. Mm -hmm. I have, I think one piece is being overlooked and I think this is the piece that's being overlooked. Okay, well, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Starks. Um, just a couple of things. One, I want to make sure, um, although we do get, we don't necessarily get all of that Chapter 70 money, the town is more than generous every year <coughs> in giving us way more than it has to per student. So the fact that they have done that year over year over year, I, in some ways, am glad that for several years we've actually been able to positively affect the bottom line in some way and kind of move that forward. I really do think that this really has to be seen. It's, it's a full community, town, you know, it's not the schools versus the town. It's all of us together. And as much as I want a lot more money for the schools because I know what we could do with that money, mm -hmm. the, there just isn't, that money to go around so we can't ask for mm -hmm. money that isn't there um, I also need to point out that unfortunately warrants that specifically ask for a certain amount kind of completely blow up or break the system that we use um, and we had this issue last year when we had someone who wanted money specifically for football helmets um, that's not the way the system works. It's not the way the budgeting system works. We don't, we don't go to the town and say we want this much for this and this much for this and this much for this. We go to the town and say the schools need this much money. Here's our budget. Here's how we're going to spend it. And so having warrants as much as we want to often have the money for the article that we have, it's also kind of doesn't fit into the the way we're supposed to have it work with the town. So I just want to make sure that that's also clear for people. The only action the school committee has to take, if any, if any, is to be prepared, if, if we want, <clears throat> to have a position on this for town meeting. Right. Um, right. And so that's and it. So they're going to ask. Right. They right. I mean, there's going to be a motion. There's going to be a, a recommendation of no action by the, by the finance committee. There could be a substitute motion. Someone would say, what's the school committee think? And we we have a we have an opinion, or we don't. Right. So that's so that's that's that's. So I just want to kind of move the discussion yeah. towards. Yeah, I want to finish this up uh, pretty soon, Mr. Uh, Mr. Schlichten. Have you spoken? Of oh, you did. No, I, I, yeah. I had my hand up the second time, but it, yeah. You did, Mr. Hanner. Mm -hmm. I correct me if I'm wrong. I don't hear. I didn't hear Mr. Johnny ask us to take a position mm -hmm. other than uh, support at town meeting. And that, that would be, mm -hmm. my understanding, would be not as a school committee member, but as a town meeting member. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, that, yeah. Well, okay. but no, but we, mm -hmm. yes, and you can speak individually, but at this point we have not made any decision as to what the school well, committee would. Right, but at the same time, we do have a uh, procedure that we go through the, each Warren article to, and make a decision at that time what the school committee's position was going to be. Mm -hmm. So I, I would ask, I guess I would ask to defer at that time to make, a decision for support, not support, or whatever action as, as a body when we go through the, the individual articles. Not tonight on that. I'm, because Mr. if Mr. Downing had asked us specifically, then this would be a chance. But in, I'd say let's defer until that night. Yeah, I'm grateful for the presentation. I think the best strategy for us would not to be taking a stand on this article as a school committee. Uh, but for us as individuals, if we choose to get up in town meeting, and even if we're not town meeting members or school committee members, we do have a right to get up and speak and offer our opinions on this. And I think that we do have varied opinions. Now, being a 22 or some odd year town meeting member, I've gone through uh, all sorts of budget cycles with all sorts of problems and worked with this finance committee. And they've done a lot to help us over, over these years. And there will, it, when, we, when we eliminated the kindergarten fee, there was a long-term gain uh, a year out 
but there was a year that we needed to bridge. And I think part of the additional money over the recoup of the fees for the first few years was in essence paying back the town for the extra money they laid out in the initial year where we got rid of the fee but didn't have the additional Chapter 70 money because that expenditure lags for a year. And after that impact uh, uh, went away, uh, we went to the Finance Committee this year and said, you know, it, it, our Chapter 70 is going up because our enrollment's going up, and we weren't anticipating this back when we went through the original plan, and they were very willing to come back with us with an additional $800,000 to cover the expenses. Now, the fiscal responsibility override we did, which was for stability, it was for more or less keeping the status quo, not for expanding programs, but be, to just to be able to deliver the same level of services in the town, so that the last override did not contemplate changing fees or other expenditures within the town, and that we weren't going to raise them or we weren't going to eliminate them either. Right. So that to, I think it is unconscionable to be charging high <coughs> user fees for athletics. I would rather spread this out to the rest of the town. We can't do it in the current levy limit. I'd love to see the town come together and say, you know what, this is not the kind of town we want to have. We want to have a town where there are no user fees for athletics. We want to support our kids. We'll raise our taxes a dollar or two or whatever it is to, to incorporate the cost of our fees in, into a specific override to eliminate that. But that would have to be a decision beyond us, beyond town meeting. It would be going to the voters of, of the entire town to say, this, you know, this is not acceptable. We want to do something different. And I agree. This, is, this, is, this isn't acceptable. But we don't have the solution in hand in our domain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Downing, I'd like to just conclude this part mm -hmm. of it uh, by thanking you for coming, mm -hmm. thanking you for coming to the Budget Subcommittee uh, some weeks ago and presenting mm -hmm. on this. You've done a lot of work, mm -hmm. and you're still probably going to do some more work between now and town meeting. <laughs> I congratulate you on that. Um, like Mr. Thielman said, we will be taking up this and other mm -hmm. foreign articles that per potentially could impact the school budget um, when we when we discuss those probably sometime next month. So um, this will help us in our in our decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, moving on to. FY super, superintendent's budget. Still your budget. Superintendent's okay. voting. Give it to us. All right. Make it our budget. Make it your budget. <laughs> well, actually, you bring up a very interesting um, distinction, and I don't. I don't think that that pe people necessarily know the distinction. At this at this juncture, this is a budget that the superintendent presents to the school committee, mm -hmm. and um, I assure you that it's not just simply. Um, my being the author of this. This is a very collaborative process in the district as we look very carefully at um, all of our needs and, and prioritize those needs. But right now it's a superintendent's budget. It's a, it's a budget where you're going to listen to uh, our presentation this evening. I will begin the presentation. Um, Diane Johnson will talk more about the numbers part of this presentation. And for those of you that are watching and want to be able to follow or the, some of the questions that will be asked later, on our first slide here is the, um, the, uh, the link to the budget on the website. Now, that looks pretty long and we probably would rather be able to just, you know, tap it and get to that. But if you go to the Arlington District website, on the left-hand column you'll see budget. Just open it up. And then there'll be the link there right to the FY15 budget. I've already this used power, it. Pardon? I said I already used it to search for a bunch yeah, of things. Searchable. It's searchable. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's great because you can search and it'll show you all the lines that have that in it. It took our webmaster, Claudia Bertoli, uh, you know, about a week to be able to set that all up so it is searchable. Because otherwise it's a pretty complex document to really make sense of. In addition, the uh, PowerPoint that we're going to be presenting this evening will also be available online tomorrow because there's some interesting graphics in it, I think, that a, a number of people would like to, to be able to see. 
So it's the superintendent's budget at this point. You're going to ask questions. You may have things you want us to amend. And through this process, uh, we'll eventually get to a point where you're going to vote on this budget. And once you vote on it, then it is yours. Right. So it becomes the school committee's uh, budget. And that is the budget that we will be taking to the Finance Committee on the 17th of March and presenting that evening. So moving along here, um, actually there's already been a lot of discussion on the long range planning. And I do want to acknowledge tonight the, co the collaborative work that has gone on this fall to address the enrollment growth that we have experienced in the last two years. In the last two years, we have seen an increase of 280 students. Mm -hmm. Looking for the, since 2000, we've seen an increase in the district of 1,000 students. But these last two really represent a big jump. Now, will this continue? That's hard to say. Um, but we have worked out collaboratively with, of course, the school committee has been part of this, the budget subcommittee the Long Range Planning Committee in town, the town manager, the finance committee, and of course the school department administration have all worked together to find a way that we are going to be able to d deal with this enrollment growth. Uh, as um, I think as Mr. Schlickman mentioned, mm -hmm. when we had the override, mm -hmm. there was a, the assumption that we, we, we would be moving forward and basically having level service budgets. And as part of that, um, that agreement that we had with the town and the voters in Arlington, we agreed that the uh, the general budget of the school of the school department would increase three and a half percent each year. Special education part of the budget would increase seven percent, mm -hmm. and then we've had uh, another change, which we'll talk about later. Which, is, of course, we've already been mentioned to the kindergarten fees, but. The, um, what we have found over the last two years is that um, the, the that those revenues cannot meet the needs of um, our increasing mm -hmm. enrollment. What we're seeing is very large class sizes, particularly um, at the secondary level in our special classes. That's where you'll really see some of the um, the larger ones, and, and certainly in our elective courses at the high school. But even with that, it, at Odison Middle School we have core classes that are all in that range of 25, 26, which is, is, which is large. That, that doesn't mean that there aren't classes that are substantially greater than that. So I think everybody agreed that what we needed to be able to do was to have um, additional funds. And those additional funds uh, very thoughtfully um, decided how we would calculate it. And it's 25% of the per pupil cost. Because some of the per pupil is really fixed costs that no matter how many students we have, we're going to, be, we're going to still have that. We're still having nine schools, for example. So there was a lot of thought out and many different models, but that's what we finally agreed upon. And it works both directions. If our enrollments go down, then we will, we will be seeing a sort of a, a, a corresponding decrease. So anyway, we're very grateful to all the people that worked together. I think that this was a great show. Uh, of, of, of working together and that, that, there, that everybody can acknowledge that there's a problem and how are we going to solve it. So going on, um, this, you can look at the numbers, but I just, but the real point of this is to show you the different um, line items. There is the general education cost, and as I said, that increased 3.5%. Special education costs increased 7%. When we went to the Finance Committee um, two years ago about this, the 970000 was what we had anticipated as revenue from kindergarten fees to run our, uh, our full-day kindergarten program. But what we needed to be able to do was to have a bridge loan, so to speak, uh, have the 970000 added to our budget so that we could reduce the fees, but by reducing the fees, we brought in additional Chapter 70 money, which I believe was about additional one point, it was about 1.6 million. So there's actually about uh, 500,000 approximately so or more that has gone into the, uh, the general uh, ledger. And so this coming year, uh, based on this formula that we have a 25% of per pupil cost, 
we will have an additional $885,000 that we will have in, in our, for our general funds for this, for a town appropriation. Now, Diane is going to talk later that we are on, we are an unusual department mm -hmm. in the district, in the town, in that not all of our revenue for running our programs comes directly from town appropriation. So, as we looked at our needs going forward, uh, there was a lot of work that was done um, with administrators, and I believe even probably discussions with with um, leadership teams at at the school level, certainly school councils, about what are our needs going forward. And the list, which was still pared down, was in the neighborhood of about $2 million. So the question I know some of you asked, are there unmet needs? Yes, there are unmet needs. But we went through the process of prioritizing those needs so that we would understand where we would be allocating the monies gen from the additional 885000 one of the important priorities was to reduce the class sizes at the middle school. And we plan to accomplish that by adding an additional cluster of uh, four teachers at the middle school. And this will probably be a mixed grade cluster. Um, that hasn't been determined yet, uh, but it will, we have an incoming class that's going to be larger than our uh, in our present sixth grade. So we know that for certain we're going to have um, a good a part of that cluster being uh, for sixth grade students. Um, we want to increase our math support at the elementary. This has been an ongoing goal of the administration and, and as well as the school committee. And we, we understand that we've had to take that forward sort of in an incremental way. This last year we were able to add um, two math coaches and the proposal this year would be to have a math interventionist. And the distinction is, is that the math coaches work with teachers. The math intervention is, is actually someone who does interventions with students as we do in the middle school. We know that we need to add <coughs> curriculum materials district-wide, uh, particularly in the elementary schools around literacy. We're going to increase um, our, reinforce our district-wide commitment to special education team-based services, which we, which was a new model and, and how we have restructured special education. And that will include a number of positions, um, a .5 team chair, uh, another uh, behavioral specialist and behavioral aid that will support that uh, person, .5 social worker, and um, other uh, point, uh, point 0.5 speech and language uh, teacher as well at the secondary level. We also know that we definitely needed to fund more in technology. Um, but fortunately this year, and thank you to um, Dr. Chesson and Ms. Johnson, they presented to the Capital Committee and the Capital Committee has very generously given us additional money next year to fund a number of, uh, of the hardware issues for technology. What the additional money from Capital will allow us to do is to have one iPad cart per two classrooms in the elementary level. Additionally, we will be able to uh, replace for many many of our teachers who have current computers or laptops which cannot, because they're so old, um, use the program that we use for teacher evaluation, Baseline Edge, and for that matter, sometimes can't even use our operating, our uh, student management system, PowerSchool. So there is a real need to be able to give our teachers the tools that they need in order to be able to, to do the work that's expected of them. And, and that is something that the Capital Committee has uh, agreed with us. So we, but when we put more hardware into the system, we need to have the support uh, from IT people in order to do this. This year was, I have to say, was very strained. We introduced a number of more iPads um, into the system and we did not really, we did not really increase at all our, our support. And I know that they have 
been um, very stressed by that, by that, the thinness of support. So really what's in the budget is not the hardware, but rather the IT support. And then, of course, we have to look for, right now, uh, keep having money in the budget for reserve teaching positions. Last year, if you recall, from May to August, we, we found ourselves in a position of having to add five elementary classrooms. This was unprecedented in many years. In addition to that, we had, to, at the secondary level, um, add, you know, a point two here or something in order to be able to to cover some uh, large class sizes. So we're, we're putting additional money in for reserve, and, if, and it could be that as we see, what, see how this all develops over the next few months, more, more importantly, probably from about May to August, it could be that we won't need all the reserve positions. It's possible. Uh, probably not likely, but then we could come back to you and talk about what might have been some other priorities that we have that are not part of uh, the budget that we're going forward with. So that's sort of the overview, the sort of the context of where this budget um, was developed from, and basically we have taken what we have right now in the, in, and rolled it over into next year, added these additional positions, as well as all of the uh, fixed costs uh, going forward. And fixed costs involve step and lane changes and salary increases for our teachers and other staff, people who have contractual, um, have, have current contracts, a as well as the costs um, that we have for special education that creates a new uh, base for next year as well, and, I, and Diane will get into that a little bit in more detail. So that's the overview, and I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Ms. Johnson. So unlike other departments in the town, the schools only receive a portion of their budget, admittedly the lion's share of the budget from the town. We also enjoy revenue streams from grants and from revolving. Our assumptions on grants for the upcoming year are pretty much level funded. Yeah, we've assumed a 1% reduction um, based on our best information on most of the grants, but overall uh, we know for a fact that we have funding in the Project Success Grant and there's some other balancing factors. With the revolving, we have factored in um, our fees, assuming no increases to fees except the um, the long-term rentals for the after-school program that we're going to take up later tonight, and Circuit Breaker. Um, just to remind you that the way Circuit Breaker funding works is that we are actually in FY14 spending the Circuit Breaker revenues we collected in FY13. And what we're proposing for FY15 is the amount we've been told that we'll receive this year. What often happens with Circuit Breaker funding is there is a differential at the end of the year if the state has additional funds they allocate it out to the circuit breaker district, so very often the fourth quarter payment is larger. In the fall, when we come back together after the summer recess, you'll receive a, an updated funding summary which shows where the grants came in actually as opposed to what we're proposing now, and they also show the differential to circuit breaker. Those changes in this past fiscal year were very helpful in covering the five additional elementary teachers when we only had two reserves in the budget. So. I just wanted to make that clear. We're very fortunate in following state recommendations on the circuit breaker by retaining an entire year's circuit breaker, spending the previous year, collecting the current year, and planning on it. It also um, prevents us from having a situation where we're guessing circuit breaker will be enough, mm. and then you know, we're, not in, we're in a positive situation. It also provides an additional cushion. If we should need to dip into it, we have those funds available to us. Um, and that just, this, this slide compares FY14 to FY15 and shows the overall increase in revenue. For people following along at home, this is section three of the budget book, um, the funding summary. And this chart, um, though not showing up as well as I'd hoped, it looks better on a small screen. Um, and I thought green was an appropriate color since it's revenue. Um, shows the different sources of revenue 
Um, I've broken out the Chapter 70 allocation from the rest of the town appropriation, but both of those pieces It's only the two small pies at the top that come from other sources. So um, given our net increase in revenue, um, our total mandatory increases come to about $2.1 million. We're proposing $1.3 million of increases. We're doing some modest restructuring uh, to bring ourselves into proof. And this is, it. this is represented best in the budget book in section two in the superintendent's budget message. For those at home, if you haven't had a chance to read this, this is really the best single piece of the budget to look at to have an understanding of what's going on. There's a narrative that explains um, our goals and what we're proposing to do and how they tie back to the district goals. There's a summary of all of the additions and deletions to the budget. There's a footnote that explains each and every one in detail, and at the very end, there's also a list of those things that we would have wished to have done had we had more money, but are unable to do. We considered them valuable, but just the funding didn't reach that far. And this is a breakdown of our budget um, that allows us to look at sort of where our money's going as a whole. Uh, you see that uh, it's regular ed, Special ed are the big pieces of the pie. One of the new fields that we're looking at this year for the first time is something called interventions. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. That's the brown pie on the, uh, <laughs> the right-hand side, about the middle. Looking at... Diane. Why don't you take um, Karen's microphone when you're talking? Okay. Looking at a five-year comparison by certain categories, you can see some of the trends that we've been looking at. General uh, education is in blue. Ms. Johnson? Yes? You're standing right in front of I'm so the sorry. screen. I'm sorry. But not obscuring the view from home. <coughs> the blue represents special ed, this, this red in the middle is interventions, and, I, and while that's a relatively small category in the budget, I think it's a very important category to bring to your attention because this represents the activity that supports the students that are struggling but whose struggles may not have reached the level of needing special intervention services. This is reading, math coaching, math interventions, literacy coaching, guidance, these are, the, these are the things that really help the whole student and the student that isn't cruising. And I think this is such an important part of the budget. Unfortunately, this is always a part of any school budget that's vulnerable to cuts. It doesn't affect class size. It tends to be those fungible areas that get the ax first. And so I want to keep these in the front of the budget so we're thinking about it so that we don't think about that as stuff that's appropriate to liquidate when things start to tighten up. I, I really see them as a very important cost containment measure to help contain special ed costs, but more importantly to really create what we need to support all learners, regular ed and special ed. Pretty much um, this slide just says in words what that said in pictures. And I wanted to talk a little bit here about special ed cost growth because I know that's a matter of concern for our district and for many districts. As Dr. Bodie said, we have asked and received from the town a growth factor of 7% on our special ed costs allocation from the town. And if you compare, in this, as this chart does, the special ed growth, which is the mm -hmm. jagged line from FY05, through the 14 <coughs> sections and the 15 budget, mm -hmm. you can see that over that period of time, which is 10 years, that we're tracking closely with the 7% line, which is in the yellow. If you shorten the time horizon, however, since FY11, our special ed cost growth has exceeded on, you know, overall the 10% cost line. Um, 
I want to speak for a minute about the differences between the way we think about special education in Arlington versus the way the Department of Elementary and Second edu Secondary Education speaks about um, special ed. In Arlington, we consider all of our costs that are related to special ed, what, regardless of their funding source. So Circuit Breaker, which we consider a revolving funding source. Grants, we have a, a SPED 94-142 grant, which provides significant funding for special ed. SPED transportation <coughs> and SPED legal charges, we consider that all part of the whole SPED picture. But when the state is thinking about special ed expenditures, they confine their thinking to that which comes out of the general fund. They don't include these other things, though they do include circuit breakers, so that's a little not right. They don't think about grants as part of SPED in the same way. The reason I'm bringing this up is because it was requested that we look at special ed expenditures compared to other districts like ourselves to see mm -hmm. if our special ed expenditures, which are growing at a significant pace, are way out of line with other similar districts in the state. In order to do this comparison, I felt we had to go to the Department of Elementary and Secondary edu Education's view of what is SPED so we could have an apples to apples comparison. So this compares Arlington with fiscally similar communities. These were the communities that were selected in the salary study by the committee that worked with the town manager. And you can see Arlington on the far left to the state average on the far right that while we exceed the state average, we are not radically out of step with communities that have a similar fiscal base to our own in terms of their taxable income and I think development land and I'm not sure what all the factors were in creating these, com these comparisons. This compares Arlington to its academically comparable com communities who <laughs> enjoy the same level of high academic achievement that we do. And again, and the state average is far to the right. And you can see that we're pretty much in step with this group as well, that our spending is not, is not radically out of step. Hmm. This data, as I said, comes from the DESE and it's based on fiscal 12, which is a little out of date at this point, but that is the last year for which they had complete data. Um, it'll be interesting to look at this again in 13 and 14 when we have more data as we move forward through time. They're all special. And just one final, one final word. Um, when you look at the budget, it represents, I've finally been able to give you three years of actuals when you look at the entire budget. I apologize for the tininess of the font, but I do think it's important to be able to see three years of actuals. I give you FY14 projections, but I want to inject a note of caution about projections. Many school expenses tend to be front-loaded in the first half of the year. Mm -hmm. I download the expenditures out of our financial system at the mid-year point and basically multiply it by two. And then I go back through the budget and I tweak it where I know why I have greater information. You know, obviously, if I were to take the expenditures and the encumbrances for out-of-district tuition and multiply it by two, we'd all have a heart attack because that would be radically wrong. So I spend a lot of time on that. But as you delve into the finer and finer layers of granularity, when you get into the budget detail, for example, in section eight, the projections are often seem out of step. And there are a variety of reasons why that may be so. I think it's very important when you're looking at the budget that you look at the three complete years of expenditures more closely than the most current year of projections. Just because of the timing, even the mid-year, the, the January 1 download, when I, what I'm doing for the expenditures to use that drives the projections, does not capture the mid-year point of teacher salary. It's actually short of that by a month because, the ten month, because of the distribution of the 10 months. Um, really, what you want to look at are the three full years of expenditures, the actual expenditures. That's what really happened in those lines. And I, I use those much more heavily when I'm looking ahead to this year's budget, the projections only serve as markers for specific things about which I have knowledge. For example, mm -hmm. I know transportation costs are going up next year mm -hmm. based on the contract we have with um, the collaborative on, on SPED transportation. I know, based on a variety of factors that I reported to you before, that out-of-district tuition is <coughs> way up this year, and that's driving next year. But for the most part, on your, on your 
finest lines of granularity, it's the three years of actuals that are driving the bus in terms of what we're looking at comparatively. So please don't put too much emphasis on the projections column. It is especially at the tiny levels. At the bigger levels, it works better, but at the teeny tiny levels, it doesn't work that well. So I want to ask some questions. I want to ask some general questions about the budget, but I want to ask uh, questions to start about special education. And we had a little, little conversation beforehand because I wanted to tell you what I, what I was thinking. That <clears throat> when I look at the um, where the budget has gone in terms of special education costs, from the FY11 actuals to the FY15, FY14 projections and FY15 proposed budget. It's about it's about a 4.8 million dollar increase in special education costs, or 33 percent jump mm -hmm. over a five year period, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it's critical that we're able, since this is now going to become our budget, we're able to explain to the finance committee and the and the public and town meeting uh, the reasons for that. Um, and, it, and it, we can't just explain it with anecdote. We've got to explain it with some data. And so the, the questions, the, the data that I think is, is critical for us to know is the number of out-of-district placements year to year, because that's a big, that's always a cost driver. It's like always a huge cost driver. So that, that, that's an important thing for us to understand. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to understand um, the kinds of um, disabilities that we're confronting or that we have, that we're confronting over the, here in Arlington over the past uh, five years. And um, how similar or different that is to other districts is that, you know, I think people need to understand, is this a trend around uh, the Commonwealth, around the country, or is this an Arlington trend that needs to be explained to people? And <clears throat> the other thing I think that we have to be conscious of when you see this kind of a jump, a, a $4.8 million jump in expenses over a five-year period, 33% mm. increase over a five-year period, mm. um, you know, it, it, it has the, the danger of creating a, um, a conflict or a tension, an unnecessary tension between uh, parents who have children with special needs and parents who don't. That's, a, that's something we have to just be aware of. And, it's, and so I think it's it, the message and uh, how we present it and the, and the data is important, especially in the Finance Committee presentation. It's not just, not just anecdote, it's not just kids have more issues, born with more issues and problems than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, maybe that's true, but it needs to, it needs to be documented uh, with good, good, good references, good support, good mm -hmm. data for that. So that's something I'd like to see. Um, <clears throat> the next overall com com uh, comment I wanted to make about this, or a question, I guess, is, you know, a big thing that, and I don't have, a, I don't have an answer, by the way, to the special mm -hmm. education issue, and I don't, have, I, don't have, I don't think if I have an answer to the next question I'm going to ask, and that is that, you know, we're adding uh, teachers, which, I mean, I think we're all in favor of that, and we want to address the class size issue. That was a big thing in your, in your presentation. But we also have to implement a new evaluation structure, mm -hmm. and uh, the worry that I have is when I went through this budget is, you know, do we have enough um, administrative support supervision to implement mm -hmm. the evaluation structure? And that's my, and I don't, I mean, I, I don't know, do you, I mean, I guess the answer if I were the superintendent, I'd say, yes, of course we do because I want the budget passed. But I mean, in an honest, you know, I mean, I, I, mean is, I, guess, I, guess, I guess the question, a better way to phrase it is, in all honesty, are you, I mean, is this something that you're a little concerned about? Are you, are you, is there some issue that maybe we don't have enough structure here to, to do all the, that we have to do with evaluation? Or maybe, maybe you've thought about it and we do. I have thought about it and I am a little concerned, yes. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly are going to debrief about this as we've gone through the year. And we've been very, even starting the year, we did a lot of analysis about loads in terms of, of people. But even with that, I think that there, people are finding that this is very difficult, certainly in the number of maybe observations. So th this is be something that we're going to be discussing with the AEA and the AAA um, as we, as at the end of this year. So we, our agreement is that we relook at this. I have expressed that concern with our administrators and we've talked about it. Uh, I have proposed um, thinking about 
even if not a full time, but maybe an assistant um, at the elementary level to help with a number of a number of um, evaluations. But I will say that the principals and curriculum leaders faced with putting money toward that would rather put it toward teachers. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, th they were very clear about that. They would rather shoulder the burden uh, uh, and, the in and the intensity of this rather than not have, they'd rather have whatever money could be available to put toward class sizes. I think that uh, I would like to revisit this issue. In fact, for me, in that list I was telling about a million dollars plus that was, we're not addressing, that would be up there for me. And I, I will want to hear more as we, toward the end of this year, when we debrief about it all, uh, what we might be able to do. So, as I said in my initial comments, we have put money aside for res reserve positions. To the extent that we may not need them all, I would like to revisit some things, and that is one of them. Is it ever, is it, is it possible, I mean, in, in any, uh, I mean, maybe not in elementary school, but in a secondary, uh, in secondary ed to, to lighten the load of, of, of a few teachers so that they can have some coaching and instruction, uh, coaching and uh, evaluation? Mm. Or is that not, is that not, I don't, I don't know. know. Is that, that's just no, not we've actually had a lot of discussion about that. It, um, no, the teachers that, that are teachers and they're part of the AEA it's cannot do evaluations. Okay. Mm, and okay. also, we, there's been discussion about whether some people could be in both, both positions. And I know that some neighboring towns have done that. And having lived with it for a year or two, they've done away with it. It's, it's sort of an either or mm -hmm. um, situation. I think at the secondary level, while there's certainly um, a lot of, certainly a lot of people, most people are evaluating the 20 plus level, which is very high. That's a lot. Definitely high, and there's some people even closer to 30 or more. It's a lot. We have set up a structure where we have a principal evaluator and a secondary. We have a very elaborate chart in how this is done. My my concern is more at the elementary, to be honest, um, because in a, in a building, the only person doing evaluations is the the principal, and uh, we well, I shouldn't say only person because we do have our special education coordinators helping with specialists, but some of the special education teachers that are liaisons are still, are still evaluated by the principal. So I have some thoughts as to how we could use an assistant at the elementary, even if it was part time, but right now that, I was, re, re, I was resoundingly, isn't that true? Absolutely. Yes, yes, they said, no, we would rather put this into teachers. That's good to hear, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Ms. Starks. Uh, another high level uh, question slash concern is the fact that the move to the new Common Core, um, I know at least in my district, is causing a huge uh, amount in our budget on uh, new curriculum needs. Now I noticed that curriculum is one of the things on here, you don't necessarily specifically say that it's due to the move to Common Core, and I know that, you know, some may not require it, but for example, I know in math, the whole methodology of teaching and what is taught is changing at each grade level. So um, mm -hmm. the need for new textbooks and new training and all of that stuff, um, I don't know how much of that is also in this budget and where do we find that? You, you did vote in a significant uptick in math materials at the middle <coughs> school. And that carried from last year's budget to this year's budget. So that will enable us to continue to roll out the math at the middle school. This is an enhancement on top of that of curriculum materials. And I've moved, I've moved the money around. It's now in Dr. Chesson's budget. So she can put it throughout the district where it's best suited and best needed. For curriculum. <coughs> okay. Judd, can I? Yes, sure. I'm, I'm sorry. You, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I was the one that asked for the, the comparison to the other districts, and I was the one that asked for the uh, kind of the, the, the most a detailed view of special ed. So thank you for doing that. I meant, to, I meant to preface my comments with that. So thanks for doing that. I asked for it, and you were kind enough to do it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hamm? Are we getting down to the nitty gritty? I don't say why not. Okay. Mm -hmm. I apologize if I have you jumping around, Diane. <coughs> 
uh, under tab eight. Well, first up, let me just ask this. The $800,000 plus dollars that we've got from the town for our additional enrollment, is that just spread out through the whole program? There wouldn't be a line item or anything there? Great. Under tab eight, um, under, on page 43, uh, I guess uh, school committee uh, 57, you have $35,000 for school committee insurance. Correct. Could you or Dr. Vody tell us what we're insured for? Is that a liability issue? Yes. Why aren't we covered under the Mass Torts Claim Act through the town as opposed to having us have a, uh, a specific line item for $35,000? Well, you are indemnified. Which yes. is the Mass Torts Claim yes. Act. Yes. But there also could be, um, it's, it's, it's also beyond that. If you have, it's potential to be sued for other things that would not be necessarily an issue of indemnification. And if there were, was a, a settlement or a, a finding by courts, that could be a, a place where you would look for the money rather than in the budget. Okay. I think that's a decision that we should probably send us to the a subcommittee and look at that very carefully. What's happened, and this is not, this is not just Arlington. School mm. committee insurance policies have gone up a lot. We talked about when that. there's single, well, when it's just simply a policy. If we were to do something more townwide which is something we could maybe should all talk about it's, right. but I think it's right now this, this we you haven't decided what you want to do and so it's in the budget okay. maybe that's something we need to talk about now this is one of the situations where the projection is right on because it's already been paid for this year okay. so, so that projection is exactly what I'm, we paid I'm, mm -hmm. my it's a small piece of the budget but it's thirty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars that I think municipal employees uh, besides the mass torts claim act if we have a need for something that's slightly different, I'm sure other boards and other in the town would too. And I accept your idea of talking, and maybe we can do it together. Something on that. Um, the and I'm, you don't have to go back and forth, but on, on tab six, page two, uh, legal services for special ed is listed as two hundred thousand, and then that's line six eight six six. Our item number, I'm sorry. It's 200,000, and then two lines down, legal services for school committee is 400,000. Is that a total of $600,000 we're budgeting for legal services? Well, it's actually three pieces, and depending on the view you look at it, it looks differently. In this case, because you're looking at it by program code, okay. you see the special ed legal. And what you see under legal services school committee is the two hundred thousand dollars for school council, which would include labor, okay. and two hundred thousand dollars for settlements. Okay, we've carried a two hundred thousand dollars. If that is broken down on page uh, under it's, back on ta tab eight, it's eight. actually broken down in the object summary, which is the next one. It's a little easier to see it there. And seven. Um, if you look at legal. But get everybody the page number. Tab. And yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is tab seven. Right. It's the next one. And it's 83102. It's on page two of three legal services. 83102. Legal services. Mm -hmm. three. One. So if you if you look across this line, I think this is important to look at. Now this number right here would include the $200,000 for special ed legal services and the $200,000 for general ed or school committee or superintendent legal services. The important consideration here on that $400,000 is if the last year we were in negotiations is FY12. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to FY12, we spent $352,000 in that year. The subsequent years we've spent less because we haven't been in negotiations. And so I felt the $400,000 in this upcoming year, which will be a negotiation cycle, would be prudent to be sure that we had sufficient to manage whatever was needed as part of the negotiations. The um, <coughs> court judgments slash damage settlements 87601 is on page three of three. 
And as you look across that line, you can see that the amount that we've spent in settlements has varied widely over the years that we've carried this line, from a low of not even $2,000 to a high of 120000 to this year where it will be the entire 200000 And so while that's a line where there's tremendous variations, we've recommended the $200,000 again just because this is an area where it's good to have some security and knowing that that's there. Okay, for clarification, the, what you just said in settlement, are you talking special ed settlement and labor settlements? Yes. Yet the legal piece in the SPED uh, under special education was $200,000, so we're But that's, that's just, that's for legal counsel, not for settlements. So when we- We're spending 200, we're, in, we're budgeting $200,000 for legal counsel and special education, am I correct? Yes. Okay. Well, it's, it's all of all that would be involved. It's not just no. counsel fees. Well, what if it isn't settlement? What else is it if it isn't counsel fees? What else are we talking about? Well, sometimes you can have um, people that have to be brought in as consultants in a legal case. I mean, those are, those would be costs that would be. Perhaps put special okay. testers, yeah. special consultants. Okay. Mm -hmm. On under tab eight, and this may be just uh, format. Uh, page forty-three in tab eight. Uh, under the school committee, we have no legal services budgeted. Correct. That now resides in the superintendent's budget. But it says school committee under the superintendent's budget. It does. It, you know, legal services school committee is a is a moniker I took from the DESE and I'm, their I'm, chart of accounts. I'm not questioning it. I'm it's just, just saying, a misnomer. I'm just saying, if you look at this, it says the school committee has no legal services budgeted. But if you go into the superintendent's budget, it says the school committee has a four hundred thousand dollar budget. Right. It's just to me a little bit confusing. It is. And under the on the it says, court judgments, damages, and settlements two hundred thousand dollars. Back in the expenditures for fiscal 13. See, by looking at it in section eight, if it was budgeted in one place in one fiscal year and another place in another fiscal year, you're not gonna see the comparison. So the, I'm, the just, I'm just saying the best place to see it is in the other tab. Fine, but if I'm the public and I just pick up this one line, it looks like our expenditures for fiscal 13 was $1,278. Well, let's go back to tab seven. Here. Right here. On, this is, uh, and it, that's exactly what it does show. It's $1,278 How much? for that year. Was that, that? that number was correct. Okay. So that would be 13, FY13. Okay. Thank you. For now. Any other questions for Superintendent Ms. Johnson? Ms. Dr. Ramos, anything? Just a very simple request. Mm -hmm. um, in cases like that where we were allocating something as one area and then switched, is there some way of just doing some sort of footnoting mm -hmm. that would reference um, the different locations that we could find that? Because I think that might be a way of answering the questions when mm -hmm. somebody's looking at it, a footnote saying, like, also refer to this. And if somebody sees mm -hmm. the number in one place for a couple of years, yep. sees it in a different place for mm -hmm. another couple, it, it's just... Um, You're talking about a monstrous amount of work. Yeah. Well. I mean, and if, if that's desirable, but that's going to add weeks <coughs> to my workload. Can you, you can do, you can do searches though. Yes, you can yeah. search on the, on the digital. If you use the online version, you can plug that in and it will take you to every spot. You could use the object code and it would carry you to every spot in the budget where that was referenced. Right, mm -hmm. or maybe just some catch-all at the beginning or, mm -hmm. or end of the document just saying, you know, like, you probably know off the top of your head which ones have transferred over, mm -hmm. over the past few years. Or may know, probably know better than I do it. But, but some way of just having some kind of central, easy way for people to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it would make it, I don't want to add weeks to anybody's job, but it seems like 
there's whether there's like a note every time there's a at the bottom of every single page saying like if an item is discontinued mm -hmm. refer back to x section to to you know find where that item would now be tracked it's just every year it seems that oh i moved that and now it's over here and oh i moved that and now it's over here so you know it gets zeroed out in one place and then a huge jump in another and i think it's just really hard to follow now i'm sure that it's hard to follow for you too but it's like impossible for us so we right. don't even know why and i really like, why did it move what is it you know well and this is the downside of this level of granularity and budgeting mm -hmm. yeah. right and i right. appreciate right. all right. the work that you have put into like diane making this so much more transparent i mean there oh, are a absolutely. few of us that have absolutely know where you mm -hmm. took this from yeah. firsthand mm -hmm. and see where it is now and and so like there's a tremendous amount of respect mm -hmm. for the way you have been trying to tweak mm -hmm. this and have this make sense and, and follow having mm -hmm. more uniformity between the state recording mm -hmm. and our recording. Um, but it just <coughs> remembering those days where there was so much public distrust, mm -hmm. just some catch all. Well, here's my dilemma. Uh, my training isn't as a finance person, it's as a historian. And so I have a deep and visceral knee jerk reaction against cha rewriting history. But in terms of doing this, the, the, the way to do it would be to go back in time and pretend it had always been in this line item and just simply move the expenses back in history so everything trues out. Mm. Right. But my visceral reaction is I want to know the history. At some point, a decision was made to put these expenses in this place. Mm -hmm. There was some thinking there. Right. And then they moved for another reason. And for some reason I, that I can't really articulate on the fly, I feel there's some value in knowing that. You know, for example, the... Um, legal costs once resided in the, in the school committee budget, they now reside in the superintendent's budget. Mm -hmm. You know, at some level, it's all money. Mm -hmm. right. But, you know, I just, you know, I would certainly much prefer, though I don't like the idea, to go back and change history and mm -hmm. pretend it always lived where it lives now than I would like to go and footnote everything, because mm -hmm. that would drive me insane. <laughs> and, and I can see, if, you know, when you do change history, having an asterisk, you know, as like, printing asterisk mm. the new title and that just always means that this you know historically that there's history because there's always the hard copy somewhere that somebody can reference back if they really want to be those stories. and see my fear is that you know again with the eye to transparency i put it there once and fy11 it was here and now it's not you're playing games with the past mm. you know and, and as again my training is as a historian you don't move the past you leave it the way it is so you know this is what i'm i'm up against and it's tough to it's tough to do I mean you know at this level of granularity it's impossible that everything's gonna line up perfectly mm -hmm. it's just impossible and to to go through and flag every anomaly to write about every anomaly to footnote every anomaly mm -hmm. would make me want to seek a new line of employment mm -hmm. you know it, it's monstrous so I'm you know I'm not really sure what to say about that well, perhaps mm -hmm. you can give it some additional thought and I certainly will another solution that we haven't brought but it seems like there has to be some way of tying well there is if, if you look at the higher levels of summary you see how it collapses mm -hmm. together you know in those other views in the object view and the program view and the in the cost center view you see how everything relates to each other it's only when you get way down into the weeds that things start to come apart right and how valuable is that truly mm -hmm. but that's also the piece of having a line in the um, footnotes section at the bottom of each page saying, you know, for items that have been moved, mm -hmm. refer back to this page. You know, so it's just constantly transparent. Okay, we've given ourselves okay, 60 sorry. minutes on this topic, so I want to confine it to that. We've Here's got 10 more minutes. Yeah. Dr. Allison Anthony first. First, I just wanted to ask if, when something was moved, if the column was just, had a couple asterisks, at the name, so then you knew that that one's moved somewhere. It hasn't just disappeared. Mm. Right. Would that be helpful? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so and it that doesn't that even need to. No, just, it doesn't just need saying, to say where or why. Just, yeah, just an asterisk, so we know. Okay, it went somewhere else. It's it's, it's changed. This right. is a pivot table. Mm. It works mm. as a digital database. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as you suggest to throw a footnote the way you're suggesting. 
Or at least I don't know how to do it, so I'll go do uh, some more see, research. I'm not saying a footnote. I'm just saying in the name of something, if it's moved to a different category in a different year, it just gets an asterisk. Once it, when you say, okay, I'm going to put this in a different category. So the legal expenses that were being talked mm -hmm. about that moved from one to the other, the year that you decided that it was going to move from the school committee budget to the superintendent budget at that point you just put an asterisk at the school committee legal service and so we go okay that means it's moved so wait i know to go look for it it's not that it's been zero right right that, that's just so all. that we know oh okay it didn't just zero out it yeah. it's it got moved and we'll look for it somewhere else i mean we don't need to know where or, we're not or we're not saying that we're just saying the, that you know in the number thing instead of just a dash so it's not you know so we know it's not zeroed it's moved or something right oh yeah yeah or conversely when something is zeroed mm -hmm. put a zero mm -hmm. have the zero there mm -hmm. so a dash then means so a dash means it moves somewhere like we're just trying to no. understand do you see what do, do you guys know gonna, how pivot table no it's works? not gonna that's not gonna work okay. it's not gonna work okay. yeah that, now if I may try to get into this, Please. okay? <laughs> Help me. <laughs> I, 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 I love the granularity, and, and I think that to go through this granularity and notate anything that's a, a change in, 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 at this level of granularity would require you to hire a full-time assistant to document the change on the granularity level. Um, but in order to... <laughs> excuse me, inform us of where major things have happened. Perhaps one of the things we could do uh, is ex you know, take, a, 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 take, take it out of, off the pit, pivot table, cut and paste into a document, do, do a search, and, and have us set a threshold if something is zeroed out or if there is more than a 20% reduction or a 20% gain on a line item or 50% or some threshold where it's a manageable thing where we're picking up the the big changes and having a page for the big changes of note and not worry about all the rest that that could be a quick down and dirty way to to get at the the things that have have moved without spending more than an hour or two uh, uh compiling another page in the document you know I, I, you having know, I, a cover sheet that that talks about principal changes makes some sense my fear about dumping it into an Excel and stripping out the pivot tables is then you run the risk of being out of proof. I mean, all of the documents in this budget come out of one set of data. Mm -hmm. And I slice and dice it using pivot tables so it comes out different ways. Yeah. If I start killing that function by adding an asterisk or a dash yeah, or all you of can't, that, you can't I can't do, do it anymore. No, no, I know no, that, I, that I understand that a pivot table, the data is the point and mm -hmm. lots of things are pointing at it. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is, well, maybe then the things pointing at it if it's a new thing, mm -hmm. it could be bold. If it's a thing that's been zeroed or moved, it can be an asterisk. You can change the names. Well, the pivot table the isn't going to play with that. itself, okay. I understand, you can't yeah, change. The pivot table yeah. 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 yeah, it's okay. really a good one, but I, let's no, I, Dr. Allison mm -hmm. Amber. Yeah. OK, so I understand I had a bunch of concerns about discrepancies of salaries. And I understand that you're saying that the, when they're pulled, mm -hmm. that when you multiply by two, it's too early. And so that's mm -hmm. why there's a lot of, of lower levels. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, and, you're concerned about discrepancies between the projections and the next year budget? Yeah, it was the projections. Mm -hmm. and, and well, it was, a, it was this year's budget versus the projected use for this year, you know, pr projected expense for this year. And it, in a lot of places, they're like a full person down. Yes. And so then when we're talking about adding someone, it, it was just very confusing to me because it looks like there's already room for another person. So are we adding really two people or, you know? It, it, there isn't. What the, what the problem you're seeing very clearly is that people are being paid in the payroll system not where they've been budgeted. Mm -hmm. And so the, the teachers are all there. They're just not in the right place. And this is, this is something we, that's been a deficiency because we haven't had the staff to be able to do a thorough comprehensive review on an annual or semi-annual basis to look at every single person in the payroll system, where they're currently being paid, and where I budgeted them to be paid. Particularly in the area of special ed, they move around an awful lot. 
but in other cases, they're in grants, they're out of grants, and this kind of practice mm -hmm. of checking this every year has not been part of the mm -hmm. practice, and so we're trying to evolve that. But I was down staff this summer, mm -hmm. and this is something, and I have a new staff person who's coming on, who's taking on this project, who's begun this work, but it wasn't completed in time for the projections this time. Oh. So I feel that we're very right on with our salary spending, but the variations you're seeing at this granular level reflect the fact that maybe this teacher is being paid out of SLCB because that's where they were last year, but actually they're budgeted as a liaison now. But, okay. And that's the corrections that need to be made at a very person by person level that haven't been yet. Okay, so first, the one I really didn't have hardly anything that was special ed, so I don't think it was that. Um, I think it's great if you're working towards that just because it makes it much cleaner. It, it, it does, and yeah, it's just, it, does. It, it, it just stops a bunch of conversations in their trunks, mm -hmm. and otherwise we're going to have to keep explaining this to people because yeah. they're going to look at it, and people are going to come to us and say, look, there's already room here. What, you know, mm -hmm. Why aren't there more teachers or whatever? Right. And, and there are some mm -hmm. spots where I believe I know, I have personal knowledge that there is a person missing, and that one that was down and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, the few places where we have data, it's, it's hard to check. So I applaud trying to get to there and mm -hmm. just it'd be nice to have um, I mean for the salaries which we do know what they are um, it'll it'll be nice to have them the estimations match the expenditures um, mm. and that was that is a big chunk of things um, I also shared uh, Ms. Stark's concerns about the whether we have unmet needs in textbooks mm -hmm. and, and stuff. And I understand that now it's housed in the assistant superintendent's um, mm -hmm. department, but I'm concerned that I still don't have a sense of whether it's going to cover or not. Mm -hmm. it, I, I'm worried we've got a mm -hmm. big problem that we don't know about because mm -hmm. we're not looking at it and in, in actually assigning numbers to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then finally, I'm concerned that we're spending an awful lot on legal and, and mm -hmm. agree with Mr. Hainer. Mm -hmm. um, I question whether we need 200000 for court settlements in the setting of having s settled the major case that we had mm -hmm. hanging over us. Uh, to just touch base uh, just for a moment on textbooks, um, we are in the process of looking at what our needs are for uh, we, uh, the, I know for example literacy grades K through 8 we already have our estimates for next year what we need in terms of what we absolutely need for Common Core and what we'd like to have for Common Core and just like as we come to every budget cycle there's always a difference between what we would really like to have and what we absolutely need to have and we, I feel more than comfortable that we're going to be covered for what we absolutely need to have um, and then we're trying to look and see how we can be creative with what's left over to get what we, you know, what it would be, not nice, but that's that next level. Um, we are looking a lot um, at uh, digital resources and open source resources, um, particularly at the elementary level now where the, the, le the uh, level of uh, technology is high enough that we would be able to do that. So I, I hear you and, and I can't say it's, we got it made, but I do think it's something that we've looked at very carefully and we'll continue to look at carefully. The, the things that especially worry me are more science at the high school level, foreign language at the high school level. Yep. I'm thinking, I feel like we had math at the middle school level right. that mm -hmm. coasted for years past when it should have coasted. Right, and there. And, and we didn't flag it as a need. And I just worry that there's other things out there mm -hmm. like yeah, that. I, I work very closely with um, Catherine Riz and uh, Larry Weathers, who are the curriculum directors for the area that you're talking about. Catherine has already highlighted the books that she needs for next year. We've already had that conversation. Um, when we replaced books for her this year, we bought classroom sets and then bought digital copies uh, access for kids. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of the trends that were going on. And particularly in science, um, with the exception of AP, because the, the test is predicated on the book. But when we look at the other areas of science, again, we're looking at um, many more digital resources than we've used in the past, um, and we'll continue to do so. One comment further on the science. You know, the, the new science standards have just been released, and I know that the director is looking carefully at this in terms of what it is that um, we do need to have. The, the 
issue with science is that you could buy a textbook and it could be obsolete in a year or two. So knowing that, it's what is the, what is the best way that we can have the materials that we need? What kind of uh, science kits do we need at the elementary? Uh, what there, there's, there's going to be a process over the next year or two of really aligning content, curriculum content, to the new standards. And I think that until that process is complete, um, we're going to judiciously buy what we need. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that we'll ever go the route of having a textbook um, going forward. And that brings up, I just, what's the difference between textbook and then there, there were two line items. There's instructional materials and, and books and, and then there's textbooks. And it's increasingly fuzzy. Okay. I so mean, you know, that, that, that line is blurred and even in this, the reason those two are distinct is because the state asks for them distinctly. Oh, and okay. even in how they're, you know. I think as things become more digital, they'll right. fall more under the general rubric of instructional materials. Just okay. One last point. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I think that we've been struggling with a couple things here, and I just want to get some clarity um, in my mind as to where we are uh, in the budget process, in that when we adopt this, this becomes our policy document. And so the, what we're really engaging in right here is a policy exercise of how we want our resources directed uh, as opposed to an accounting exercise of, of where the line items are. So that I, you know, in, in terms of looking at this, I, I agree with my colleagues who are looking at the leadership issues. Uh, given, given the workload of, of complying with the evaluation system in the district, uh, I think that we really need to look at doing more to fund that regardless of whether the principals think it's a good idea or not. We're, we're budgeting not only in terms of policy to, uh, for the incumbents, but in terms of having positions that will attract folks to get into it in the future. And if our leadership positions become onerous as a result of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, the principal of you know, the, the uh, staff of Val system, yeah, we're going to have a hard time attracting and retaining principals in the district. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the, the heart uh, of the principals is one thing, but the reality of the, of, of the world out there and the marketplace we live in when we need to hire principals and retain them is, 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 is another thing, and I think that we should be looking at that a little more carefully. Well, right now in the budget going forward, we have for five positions mm -hmm. um, basically for additional teachers. So if we were to, if you look at this from a big point of view, we have all of the teachers that we have right now, what's what we're currently having, mm -hmm. and we're rolling it forward based on what the contractual mm -hmm. obligations are. We have a new base in special education that's gone up about mm -hmm. seven, eight hundred thousand dollars If we didn't have that enrollment growth, we would be looking at mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of about a hundred to 200000 for anything beyond mm -hmm. what we currently have. Mm -hmm. So we have the 885 and what, we, what you saw are uh, what we thought were the budget mm -hmm. priorities. So tonight, really, what we're looking from you mm -hmm. is, you know, what is it that we would cut from what we're currently doing mm -hmm. to fund something else, mm -hmm. or what is it in the budget priorities that you would rather see than what we mm -hmm. have offered to you as mm -hmm. a collective priority list? Mm -hmm. And if the issue is administrative support, mm -hmm. one way that we could look at that is reducing the number of potential positions to four in reserve and allocate that money. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the kind of decisions that need to be made. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing I would say to everybody, and this is, um, well, th this is a blueprint. Mm -hmm. things, can, things change and people moving. We have people 
resigning, moving in all mm -hmm. the time. And that whole piece is very uh, fungible. Mm -hmm. So these are our best estimates of cost. So, but as we move mm -hmm. forward and each month we're going to have a clear idea, particularly when we get into the summer. So I'm not ruling out that possibility. In fact, to me, that's very important. Mm -hmm. But if right now you wanted to say as a matter of policy, mm -hmm. I think that's so important that I at least want to have it in the budget right now and let's just see how everything else spins out as we go forward. That's the kind of information we're trying to have here um, from you because we'd have to modify this a little bit before you had your final budget. So that's, I think that, I think I, I appreciate that you're coming back to what's the big picture mm -hmm. what we want to accomplish tonight. Yeah. So my question is, is in terms of the policy statement, if, you know, what, we've had a, a, an interim principal in one of our schools for two years. Uh, uh, it's getting harder to hire elementary principals. The, the pools are reduced. Um, these are challenging positions, and the workload is intense. And if we were to go, and, and I'm particularly worried about the elementary folks because uh, they're they're alone in their in their house. Um, what level of support, particularly for the for the elementary principals, can we make? To lighten the load, and are and are our middle and high school people with the support able to manage uh, the, the task of being a, 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 an evaluator within the system? Now, it could be that there there are ways to take administrative tasks off their plate right. exactly. by having a a some sort of a non-instructional assistant to do to do some of the liaison work or you know sharing that kind of a job or by mm -hmm. having a half-time teacher who is a, a principal intern or a, any kind of a scheme mm -hmm. to, to to build the, the pool of potential principals and to lighten the load on our current administrators uh, I, I think is something that we should I, I'd, I'd ask you what would be a framework that would be a starting point for uh, supporting <coughs> supporting the leaders in the district. You bring up a very good point. And I also think it's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Because we have elementary school that's under 300, mm -hmm. but we have two that are approaching 500, yep. 480. Mm -hmm. So I think what is the level of support is going to vary. We used to have for principals an extra 19 hours a week administrative person. Mm -hmm. We we have not had that mm -hmm. um, we've had volunteers in schools but not paid in that respect so I mean it may be that that be a sufficient thing in some schools but it may be that in other schools we would need some actual evaluation support so you know if you want to think about taking a, posi a reserve position and having that label for administrative support it could take on various uh, mm -hmm. ways that it would manifest itself mm -hmm. as we go Forward. Yeah, I'm not looking to be prescriptive, but I'm yeah. looking. No, I but, I, but I'm perceiving an issue within the district, and I want to. Uh, you know, it, this is one of those who's caring for the caregivers argument, mm -hmm. and there, there's so you know there are certain people who, just by nature of the job, are, are going to be in a position where they they, they want to do more, and at some point you've got to uh, you, you've got to prioritize things and 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 make it a more doable job. Well, it's to, uh, to our administrator's credit mm -hmm. that we, ha we have great administrators mm -hmm. and they would rather take on more mm -hmm. themselves than have a large class size in their building mm -hmm. or uh, not have an extra section in the high school. Or, so th that's their mindset. Mm -hmm. And so yes. what you're seeing is that. Mm -hmm. As a superintendent, I am a little concerned. I share your concern. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would like, to, as we as this go forward, mm -hmm. we either wait until later and deal with it and see where we are, or now. Now, having said that, even if we put it in now, mm -hmm. and we get another 130 students this year or more, 150, mm -hmm. we're going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with that too. Yeah. So, so, but I'd like I'd like to have a proposal or a thought of. How do we do this, and how, you know, what, what, where are we being in, 
the only, what's the first yeah, step in yeah. doing Well, the only way to do it so that everything ties out is yeah. really to take one of those reserve positions and put it into that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, otherwise, th that's really the only yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Ms. Starks. Um, the only other thing that I would say, and I, I want to congratulate everyone that once again you've pulled this off, but um, I think part of the problem is that what doesn't come across in this book, mm -hmm. again, is that people who are not here every day mm -hmm. don't know that this year mm -hmm. we have a new evaluation system that we had to implement and that mm -hmm. is a huge stress on our schools and that we have a new mm -hmm. set of curriculum standards and that is a huge stress on our schools mm -hmm. and that we ha the enrollment part is in here but I would like it if we could somehow say to people you know what you need to understand that there are there are these are all the factors that our schools are dealing with this year and I'm afraid that some of enough of that doesn't come across to me in the message because I want people to understand that that's why they don't see I don't know massive innovation or massive changes or you know that there is a lot of things that are going on that we're dealing with and we deal with it all the time and I think that we get lost in that and we forget to tell people like well, but, but we have this whole new curriculum that we're trying to implement and, and this whole new evaluation system that we've been focused on. I mean, I know that personally the only professional development I've gotten all year has been on the stupid teacher evaluation mm -hmm. system. And, you know, I'm like, okay, great. I know we have a new evaluation system. But other people who don't live it every day don't understand that that's where a lot of our energy and money is going to. Um, and, or they may not understand that this new curriculum is also going to do the same thing. Or, um, and so I would like to, I think that there might be mm -hmm. also some information that needs to be in there in the budget mm -hmm. because the budget reflects that in some ways, but also just so that people know what's going on in the schools, like mm -hmm. not just budgetarily wise, but kind of where our mindset is, what our heads are at, what are we trying to, to handle. So I just also want to put that out there as, as something that it would be good to get across. I know that we all are very aware of that, but I think that a lot of people aren't. Well, it might be possible I could amend the superintendent's message because this is just mm -hmm. the superintendent's budget at this point. But I right. could take a look at that this week, so it'll give you uh, maybe a, a newer version next week. Well, you know, like add, add this into the book, you know, add this enrollment chart and, and highlight that in your message, you know, and say that this is part of the reason that we're doing certain things, you know, as an exhibit. Um, right, right, because, I mean, she does talk about enrollment and the fact that that is impacting us, but we don't talk about the other things that are also impacting, and it's not, it's not us, it's the state, right? It's, it's things from the state that we have to deal with. So. Just real quick, when you do the enrollment part, you might even want to be able to take a look and see how it's grown in just one year. If you can do a visual with that, the increase in enrollment just over a year. Uh, or even just giving people the total number of students in the schools. I think so many people still think that we have 4,000 students. Yep. You know, I talk to people and that number is still out there. We have 4,200 students, we have 40, and I'm like, no, 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 we have 5,200 students. Yep. You know, you need to, and so I want to I wanna make sure that we're getting across, like we serve, a lot of people like we need they need to know that and I really want to make sure that you know uh, our, our our schools are you know we do a lot and we do a lot for a lot more people every year um, and I just want to make sure that that gets across because I think it's important that people understand the world we're living in as we're trying to do this that it's not just the same thing this year you know that we are dealing with I think those are three of our biggest stressors this yeah. year, and and, and I want to make sure that people understand that yeah. that we're dealing with those, and that's what one of the and, things and that we're going to teachers, administrators, staff people, people are dealing with this. They would all say that they are stressed, and they would say that they were very tired, right? <laughs> at, at February vacation, very very tired. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's been a hard year. Right, absolutely right, a hard right. year. Yep. So I would like I, I would I would ask if we could try to somehow mm -hmm. get that across and, and make sure people understand that mm -hmm. these are our numbers these are this is our population these are who we're serving and mm -hmm. these are the things that we're internally been dealing with as well. All right, thank you, members. Thank you, Dr. Bodie, Ms. Johnson, Dr. Chesson. Thank you very much for the work you put into this. And this was a really really good start to this. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have more of this presumably in a week. Mm -hmm. So.
Get ready for that. Although I can't make that meeting. Text in or email. I'll be at another meeting. <laughs> uh, monthly financial reports to stay on the financial side of things. Ms. Johnson. Um, I haven't, you know, there hasn't been anything that substantively changed at the time of this reporting. We are hard on the heels of the next monthly reporting. Mm -hmm. um, we still haven't completed the winter, so we don't know where our fuel bills are going to come out. The out-of-district tuition is still continuing to track high. There hasn't been a miraculous reversal. Um, and other than that, everything seems to be going right along. So are there specific questions on the monthly reports? Since we're meeting again next week, I assume you'll be expecting reports instead of the second week as we normally meet in the month. Are we still meeting on the 13th? I think you know, we, we haven't, haven't decided had that yet. Discussion yeah. yet. <laughs> Definitely, maybe, but not guaranteed. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So you know, there may be a, there may be it may be too short a turnaround mm -hmm. to turn out the reports and the budget stuff and the statement of interest stuff mm -hmm. for next for next yeah, meeting. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. If we decide not to have it, could you just email it to us? Sure. <clears throat> Thank that you. That I could do. Mm. Any questions? Thank you, um, Dr. Bodie, Superintendent's report. Short version. Mm -hmm. Short version. Did I hear that over there in that corner? <laughs> Short version. Well. No, we did miss one last, uh, last time, so we may have some. I do have a few things. Yeah. And of course, you've already had the press release on this, and I, I, mm -hmm. I'm very pleased to re-announce um, that we have Thad Digman, who is going to be uh, the mm -hmm. new principal at Dallin. And I know that this was met with um, a lot of positive comments from both teachers and parents and mm -hmm. it's a it's a I think it's a terrific appointment but I will also say that the other two candidates we had were very strong candidates and I, and to your point about mm -hmm. attracting mm -hmm. really good people to Arlington I think we have really mm -hmm. been being seen being very successful in that in this year we had 69 um, candidates for the position and Mm -hmm. And Laura chaired the, the committee on the selection. We, you interviewed nine candidates, mm -hmm. of which we had three become finalists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, I do, I do very extensive reference checking mm -hmm. and um, positive mm -hmm. across the board. But sometimes when you're looking at a person who uh, you look for what is going to be the best match, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we feel very strongly that. Um, Mr. Digman will be, and very excited that he's going to be coming. So that's all good. Um, one of the, uh, the other thing, I actually want to turn this over to Dr. Chesson to talk a little bit about, we wanted an update on where we are with the tools of the mine, and uh, you could probably give them a sort of overview of where we are at this point. Sure. Um, as we had discussed a few meeting, meetings ago, we've established a committee um, to do the uh, reconsideration of curriculum uh, materials review. Um, we're going to be having two meetings. Um, the first meeting will be Monday, March 3rd uh, at 630, which will be right here in the uh, school committee room. We'll receive a short presentation at that time by the parents who requested the review regarding their concerns with the use of the books. Um, they've been notified and have agreed to speak. Um, following that presentation in that same meeting, there will be an opportunity for up to 15 people to speak for up to five minutes each to share concerns that they may have regarding the use of the books. Um, we really wanted to separate uh, those who had concerns from those who were in support of so that we made sure that each voice got the same amount of time to be heard. Um, so following that meeting, we will also have a meeting on Thursday, March 6th at 6.30 at the Media Center at the Hardy School because this room is currently being used at that time. Um, that meeting will begin with a short presentation by two lead uh, kindergarten teachers for the program mm -hmm. who uh, mentor the rest of the teachers in the program. Um, they will give a presentation in support of the use of the Magic Treehouse books. Following their presentation, there will again be an opportunity for up to 15 people to speak for up to five minutes each um, to speak in support of the use of the books. And then to just review the process that will follow after that, 
Um, the review committee will then meet in uh, privately to consider the information that they've heard and to deliberate. The committee will submit a report to the superintendent and the superintendent will then inform the school committee of her decision. It's expected that the time frame for the recommendation um, or the report from the uh, committee to the superintendent will be made no later than March 13th and probably sufficient, um, significantly shorter than that. But I, at that, that will be our out, outmost date. Um, so that's the process going forward. Um, the dates for those two meetings have been placed on the uh, district website, um, as well as we'll be sending out uh, emails to all the elementary um, parents so that they will know that they will be able to come and speak at those meetings so, should they so desire. Great. Any questions on? Mary Pope Osborne should thank us for all the publicity we're giving mm -hmm. her, the author. All right. Oh, the statement of interest? Mm -hmm. You have it on the. What? Nothing. Just uh, Yes, well, let me talk about, about that. We will be giving you a, uh, a draft copy of the statement of interest next week. Um, if it's not in your packets on Monday, we'll be sending it to you electronically in the beginning of the week so that you have it. But in addition to that, um, you're going to have the hard copy, or we'll send it to you of the architect's um, report. And we're in the final stages of, of editing that report, so you will have that as well. Now, one of the issues I think the committee is going to have to think about for next week is whether you, at that, at that meeting, want to vote the approval of the SOI, though it is still a draft and there may be some things that we need to change. It's, it's really, um, the SOI is just putting together the three major parts of our, the need of the school. The first, of course, is the, f the physical facility itself. And we have a lot of data. In fact, the challenge is to take the data and put it into the bites that they want for the, um, for the actual narrative. The second is why do we need, uh, um, besides fixing the, just simply the infrastructure of the building, why, why, what other things do we need? How does the building not um, support teaching and learning sufficiently? And that's really what your presentation you're going to get on Thursday night is about. And that's why we've hired an architect to take a look at what, what's, what an issue in this building and also comparing that to sort of sort of standards that would exist out there. And then the third, of course, is enrollment growth. When we are looking at when this school, say, perhaps would be renovated, say, five years out or even seven years out, we're going to have a substantially mm -hmm. larger population in this building. Mm -hmm. And currently, we don't, we, we are struggling to have enough classrooms for their current enrollment. There are in many, in all the departments, we have teachers that um, um, roam, so mm -hmm. they don't mm -hmm. have their own classroom. And every time we add a section, there's not another classroom. When we hire a teacher, we're not going to this next year. We're not going to be able to give them a classroom. That doesn't exist. They're going, we're going to, in each department, they have to figure out how we're going to schedule people in those rooms. And of course, where are we going to give that person, you know, some for a desk and a, a place <coughs> to meet with students? So even now, we, we feel the crunch. But you now add 300 more students here, approximately. This is going to be, without doing some major reconfiguration or putting some areas into service that are currently not in service, this is going to be very difficult to do. If we were able to remove every non-academic office, yours, the sixth floor basically, the town offices and stuff, would we be able to have handle our enrollment today? Today? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. certainly they could use a few more classrooms up here, but the question is, where does the administration go? I, I yeah. said that aside. Yeah, so okay. we could use these these classrooms. In, There's no doubt okay. about that. Thank you. The, I don't. So, I'm not so much sure about the um, the town offices because of their location. They're mm -hmm. 
I understand. Yeah, they're on yes. the ground ground floor. <laughs> the other question I have: Do we, ha we're on schedule to look at and either that night or subsequently uh, accept or, uh, or and approve? Do we have a date yet for the selectmen, or do they just do we bring it forward to the selectmen right after we do it? Well, they're both both bodies, the uh, school committee and the board of selectmen have to approve the submittal of the SOI. Um, I know that the chair of the Board of Selectmen has uh, agreed to have us on, or has actually let the committee, the Board of Selectmen know that we will be on their agenda on, on March 10th. I don't believe that they're planning to take a vote that night. We have to April 11th to submit this. Our, mm -hmm. our intent and hope is to get this submitted, assuming a positive vote on both boards, the end of March. Uh, Dr. Chesson heard something very interesting the other day when you were out in Maynard that they're actually going to be inviting the yeah. people going into the next phase to a meeting at the end of May. So that tells me that between April 11th and the end of May, they're going to make these, this decision. We will know fairly soon whether we're going into the next phase. If we are not invited into the next phase, then we can resubmit again next year in that, in a probably a parallel window. So. In terms of the process going forward in the town, you'll hear this on the 6th. I, I don't know what's going to happen about the 13th. Right. But you could vote it on your, your meeting on the 27th. That's, that's a little late. The Board of Selectmen, they only meet twice a month, so their next meeting is the 24th. So hopefully they will um, put that on the agenda for a vote then. Could I impose upon you all, and I know it's difficult, to get, the, get us our copy as soon as we can mm -hmm. so we can start looking at it and working on it. And mm -hmm. I don't want to rush any of the members of my, myself, but I, th I think the sooner we get it, the sooner we can digest it, well, get the vote, and then put it in their yeah. ballpark. See, see the, we, we have the part about enrollment down in the <laughs> SOI, we, and for the most part, the, the mechanical parts, it's just a question of distilling, and that, that's pretty much done. But we've been in this process of looking at the programmatic, and that's a piece of the SOI, and that report is almost done, and that's the part that has to go into it. So there's still a little bit more work to get that part of it in, and we don't have a final document on that. We probably will have the final document Monday or Tuesday. Um, so that's why the, t the two are linked very closely. You wouldn't get the SOI before we finish this report. Thank you. So that's where we are. So I think that you're going to need to think about that, whether when you want to vote this. I don't know if you want to vote it. Hopefully the Board of Selectmen is going to approve this. But their schedule will probably be hear the presentation on the 10th and, and, and bring it to a vote on the 24th. Briefly, when you give us a copy, is it, a, uh, is it at that time we, we possibly tweak it or is it just a matter of approval no I would like your um, thoughts on it and that's what we've put from the very beginning we want this to be as strong as a strong as SOI as possible uh, for people who are listening is SOI statement of interest and you know while we're immersed in it and we're writing this how you read it because we may not see where it may need to be shored up a little bit and I would like that that feedback in which case, over the next couple of weeks, we'll do that. And the same thing for the Board of Selectmen. I w I'm going to invite them if they have any suggestions as well. So you won't have a final document on the 6th, which is an issue. Um, the final document probably won't be completed for a couple more weeks after and until I get everybody's feedback. So um, it's just a procedural issue that we have to sort of uh, think about a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could wait to the 27th. I mean, it w but uh, I, I would like to get this in, assuming again, positive votes, mm -hmm. that um, by the end of March. But you think the final wouldn't be available even by 313, even by our next regular meeting? <coughs> Listen, it might be. It depends on, it depends on, the, the on Board of Selectmen is going to get it in their packets next week mm -hmm. on the uh, Friday. But that's a draft. It will, the same as yours, you're going to get the same thing. So right. if I get comments, can we incorporate that by the 13th? 
depends how extensively I vote. Well, the other thing, too, is what you're voting isn't the document. What you're voting is very specific language set forth by the MSBA. You have a very specific vote. The, nothing in the vote says we love this language or we love this SOI. It says we're asking to go forward to, to seek funding for a project. Okay. So I don't think you need to couple the two. Right. I, think you could do, point, I think you could do the vote because they, they have this whole little fill out form of exactly what you have to vote. I just went online right now. It, the vote requirements at MSBA, yeah. so you and want it really, to take a look at it. You know, and, and that gets attached to the whole big document when it goes in at the very last step. Oh, okay. So the voting can be independent of it. Right. Probably vote that to death. So <laughs> we you won't have that. Yeah. So what what that would mean is that you would get um, the final document when we're ready to submit it. Mm -hmm. for, but I, I hope that I do. We get uh, feedback, both positive and uh, also constructive as well. Because again, this is a collective effort, and we want to make sure that we're doing the, the very best job we can in doing it, in submitting this. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. cool. Anything else? In yes. Your? Okay. <laughs> I heard, but I did hear what your colleague over there saying short. So let's be short. Um, snow. snow. I do have to emphasize over again that. Um, and it's even in the policy that we have that if parents feel that they do not think that that children should their child should go to school that day uh, they disagree with my decision which by the way is made very early in the morning and things we know have changed um, they just need to notify the school and let them know that why they're not going to be there and for any, they'll be marked as an absence, but it would be essentially an excused absence. So f we are now, this is the part that I w really wanted to bring up, is that where we are right now is that we are going to have school on the Monday of the last week of June. We, we did that with the last snow day. Uh, I would hope that so that's as far as we have to go. The 23rd is currently the last day of school. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, so we shall see. The winter's not over, as we all know. I think another issue, and this, I, I had this in a, an, a forwarded email to me from one of the principals today. Um, some parents expressing concern that people are not shoveling their walks. And um, as a result, or there's big mounds be, in, a, in a walkway, so the kids are going more and more into the street. And I think right now the problem we have in town, everywhere actually, is that these mounds are now solid ice blocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it is, it is a problem. Uh, I know that um, DPW is trying very hard to get into sort of crucial um, corner areas and, and removing the snow as best as possible. But um, the winter's not over, and hopefully we don't see any more, more major storms. But um, I do urge people when we do have one to First of all, remember that you do have parental discretion, and two, um, that people shovel their walks for the children. The other thing I just want, and we can talk about this more another time. Um, well, actually, let me give you some good news. We have one of our um, our seniors uh, athletes being recognized as the MIAA Student Athlete of the Month, mm -hmm. cool. and. The MIA, MIA has a, uh, a monthly presentation to one uh, male and one female athlete, and and people and students are nominated either by their athletic, the AD or the principal or teacher, and the key the key issues of, of excellence are in the areas of academics, athletics, and community service. So it's not just an award for athletics. And uh, I'm very pleased to report that um, Anna Smokovich, who is a senior at the high school, has been selected as the MIA Student Athlete of the, of the Month Award for January. And um, Anna is a three-sport three varsity athlete. Mm -hmm. She's captain of the Arlington High School volleyball, basketball, and softball teams. She's known for her positive leadership selfless motivation and support of both coaches and teammates. Um, academically, Anna has earned a 3.85 grade point average in a very rigorous course load. And she also excels in community service efforts. 
Um, she led the volleyball team with the highest attendance in sport in in sp supporting a recent road race fundraiser and she also volunteers at a recreation center and helps run different youth camps and I'll, I'll just give you the quote by um, our athletic director Melissa Dugalecki I cannot recommend a student athlete more confidently as the one who exemplifies the standards of the MIAA and high school educational athletics her optimism determination and accountability have yielded her much personal and team success through her commitment to her teams and her role as a captain, she has bettered programs year-round through her three-sport commitment while serving as a role model with her sportsmanship, academic excellence, and unyielding leadership. So congratulations to Anna Smokovich. The other thing I want to um, uh, inform you about is the work that's going on. We'll, we'll spend more time another time about this, but um, just this week, uh, 75 uh, superintendents met with the uh, a committee of NEASC. As you know, we just went through an accreditation process in the last year, and we've talked a little bit about that. In fact, we will be talking about it in our, in our statement of interest. Um, but the purpose of this meeting was to address uh, some issues that superintendents and high school principals want the MI, what NEAS to look at, and that is their mission the cost of accreditation and the prescriptive nature of what they they often tell school di districts with respect to uh, teaching and learning. So the uh, NEASC has been very receptive to this um, to the suggestion of how we can evolve. And to their credit, before we had the world of standards and accountability, NEASC was there trying to raise the levels of um, academic excellence in our schools going back decades. But what has happened in the last um, 10 years, you're all, all well, well aware of, is this constant escalation of uh, accountability, whether it's in with standardized testing, whether it's with um, standards we have to be held to, educator evaluation systems. So there's a whole set of metrics that are coming down from the state and the federal government that are that really um, are holding schools very accountable to very high standards, and NEAS mission hasn't quite kept up with that. There, um, so it's a time of readjusting, e e evolving the organization, because because each school mm -hmm. district that's a member is NEAS. Mm -hmm. We are it's it's a member organization, mm -hmm. and so the 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 superintendents and that have ha and and actually I was part of the one of the original groups look at. Part, um, asking the to take a, a look a little bit better at what they want to have as their mission and how we can um, perhaps streamline the process. In Arlington, and this is true everywhere, in fact this was a common theme, two years of time, all professional development time in the high school was used toward doing the paperwork develop you know collecting the evidence we had crates and crates and crates of, of evidence that was given to the team so it's in this day and age when we have a, a parallel accountability system we just need to be able to think about what what would be the best best um, use of having peers come in and look at your um, your school so they're in the process of hearing, hearing testimony. They're going around to every state uh, over the next week or two, and they are going to put out, um, have a, a preliminary meeting in this in March and then follow up in May. So we, we're all very supportive of having the accreditation agency um, remain, but remain stronger and more relevant to where we are today. So that's basically where, where we are at the moment and then one last thing is the um, Odyssey Middle School play is this coming Thursday and Friday and guys and dolls and it's uh, encourage people to buy tickets you can get them at the door or they're being sold at Odyssey during the lunch hour let me see if that's everything that's it <coughs> moving on to the consent agenda 
Um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of Warrant 14109 dated January 23, 2014, in the amount of $1,418,496.08. And warrant number 14119 dated February 13, 2014, in the amount of $853,053.70. Approval of draft minutes 121213, 121913, which I'd like to call 1914. Motion. So Second. moved. Okay. Um, which one's Jed? Uh, pull in 1219. We, we had a vote. Yeah. So, so, so. Vote for everything but that. Aye. 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 All those against? And uh, I just have to uh, abstain from 1219. So can we have a vote on that? All those in favor of 1219? Aye. 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 All those against? One abstention. Okay. Subcommittee liaison reports, policies and procedures. Mr. Thielman. So we have a first reading on policy KEB. This is a new policy that the committee, the subcommittee, the policies and procedures subcommittee has been working on with attorney Bryant from uh, Stoneman Chandler Miller. It basically replaces policies KE, KEE, KE dash E, KEB, um, and KEB dash R. Uh, and so it all consolidates it into one policy on public complaints. The second, I mean, the, the second first reading is to remove policies H, HG, and JFABA, mm -hmm. which are uh, inconsistent with current law or obsolete. Questions? Yeah, starts. I don't. I'm. I'm looking through the public complaints, and I feel like there's a lot less mm -hmm. process. And I think what would be best dealt with is that it would be really good if people had some kind of a flow chart. If you have a complaint with a teacher, talk to the teacher. If you can't talk mm -hmm. to the teacher, talk to the principal. If you can't talk to the principal, talk to the department head. If you can't talk to the department head, I mean, like saying that when a staff member receives a complaint, the school committee expects a staff member to do so courteously and make an appropriate reply. What is that? Like, how do you, what do you know? What do you do? Like, I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like there needs to be more, people need to understand. Chain of command. The chain of command, exactly. Is that public absolutely has a right to complain. They should absolutely complain or at least speak with the person directly. But if they can't do that, they need to understand where that chain of command is. It certainly isn't to go directly to the superintendent and the school committee, which is unfortunately what a lot of people do. Um, so I would like it if it said more about, you know, if you have this kind of complaint, here's where you go. Like that would be more useful yeah, we had a, to people. Yeah, we had a version <laughs> that detailed. And um, we concluded that it set us up for uh, it, it exposes us to more liability than we wanted to be exposed to. That's what that's what so we concluded. Okay. And I think so. Yeah. And so that was liability. the conclusion. So in other words, it was just too prescriptive. Prescriptive. And um, so the danger that Rebecca Bryant, Attorney Bryant, said is that if you're too prescriptive, and that was an earlier version, it was mm -hmm. very prescriptive. Mm -hmm. That if you're too prescriptive, then and you don't follow the procedure precisely, then you expose yourself mm -hmm. to liability. So that's what we mm -hmm. this time. I was also going to say it's my experience that when people mm -hmm. um, do make complaints mm -hmm. to me, they typically have not read the policy mm -hmm. before bringing it forward. So, mm -hmm. however mm -hmm. prescriptive or non-prescriptive we are in the policy, it's more important that it's clear to the committee members mm -hmm. what their proper proper response is mm -hmm. yeah. than um, mm -hmm. the actual. Yeah. Level of depth yes, there. we may know that, but I mean, other people may not. Right. So, I mean, what if uh, mm -hmm. if it comes in somewhere else, mm -hmm. people need to know where it should go. And that's mm -hmm. the piece where. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, so that we simplified it mm -hmm. at the attorney's recommendation, mm -hmm. because we did have a complicated mm -hmm. version that you just articulated, mm -hmm. very similar to what you said. And um, well, I don't think it has to be. It doesn't have to be that specific. It should just say, you know, start at, at the level. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's but, not do a bad But report. I want to make I sure that the. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. I'm on policy, and I was representing pretty much the view that you've just described. Mm -hmm. And I talked to um, 
Ms. Bryant, and um, this is actually a more complicated version than the original mm -hmm. thing. It does have some different steps. Mm -hmm. It has some different people. The, mm -hmm. the big concern was that if there is mm -hmm. a do this, then do that, mm -hmm. if any of the steps are mm -hmm. missed, then that opens the door to someone coming in suing because of undone things. Right, and but I'm not saying that. I'm saying that mm -hmm. if you have a complaint with a teacher, obviously mm -hmm. go to the teacher, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to give people where they should go mm -hmm. and what level. I'm not saying it has to go to that level. I'm just saying here's some entry level. I think mm -hmm. people don't know where to go. Well, it says, so, so, it, so then why don't I, then I'm gonna read the policy. I wasn't gonna do that, but I will. So when a staff member receives a complaint, so staff member presumes mm -hmm. teacher, staff member, nurse, the school committee expects a staff member to do so courteously and to make an appropriate reply. Mm -hmm. The school committee believes that complaints and concerns are best addressed and resolved as close to their origin as appropriate to the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Thus, the committee encourages individuals mm -hmm. to present and discuss any complaints they may have with the staff member against whom the complaint is directed whenever appropriate. If the individual is not comfortable addressing the matter with the staff member, or if the matter remains unresolved after doing so, the individual may address the complaint to the building principal mm -hmm. or his or her designee or to the superintendent mm -hmm. of schools or his or her designee. Whenever a complaint is made directly to the school committee as a whole mm -hmm. or to a school committee member as an individual, it will be referred to the school administration for study and possible solution provided that the school committee may directly address complaints regarding the conduct or performance of the superintendent where appropriate. Mm -hmm. Should dissatisfaction remain after the above steps have been taken, the complainant may contact the school committee chair who shall arrange for the school committee to address the matter if the chair deems appropriate. So the process mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. you go to the staff member. Mm -hmm. If you're not satisfied with what the teacher or the staff member mm -hmm. says, then you go to the principal. If you're not satisfied there, then you go to the superintendent. If you're not satisfied there, then you go mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. school committee. So that's that's the process and the policy, and so that's as specific as the attorney recommended. Hey, can I have a motion to move yeah. to 10 o'clock rule? So move. Uh, to uh, 10.30. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Good. Um, I'm wondering, in the interest of not making this more prescriptive, but recognizing Ms. Stark's um, mm. concerns about the providing some more concrete mm. examples in terms of how the process works, whether this is a case for an exhibit that would, you know, provide an example, well, we, um, mm. or whether that would be further. We took them all out for that yeah. reason. Yeah, we went we went through this with the attorney, and uh, it, it was. Really, uh, uh, it made me think as to as to how we have to structure this in order to avoid problems, because we uh, one of the reasons why we spend so much time in arbitration over pre previous case is that we had something in the policy manual that somebody challenged legally, uh, and what and the thing is is that it cost us a lot of money to go through that process. Um, we can direct our staff without putting in the policy manual. The, the superintendent can set expectations, which would be the reasonable normal expectations for a principal or a teacher as to what to do if somebody's complaining without it being in our policy manual. And that the language that we came up with is a reasonable balance between the, what we had before and a general guideline which is saying, well, try to solve it as low a level as possible. And if it gets to us, this is why. So that's, that's why we landed here. And this is not something I would have approved looking at a blind before the subcommittee meeting, but that extensive conversation with legal counsel as to how to craft this to protect the school district and to make sense of the outside world. Uh, th this was sort of the, the balance between the two. Bill Venters. The, I agree that I think the policy that's been presented meets the needs for, for guidance and direction. Mm -hmm. 
and the person can always go to uh, an administrator and ask mm -hmm. for clarity on it. Mm -hmm. But I would also suggest that one of the issues that was in the current policy that opened us up was the opening statement, complaints about school personnel were being investigated fully and fairly. Mm -hmm. If we miss that, or somebody mm -hmm. misses it, mm -hmm. that's the liability. And I, I, that's the interpretation I got mm -hmm. from our attorney when it was brought forward. Mm -hmm. That, uh, But I, I think what we have right now personally mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. Just to put it in perspective, one of the original drafts, revision drafts, was mm -hmm. like a one-line, what was it, complaints mm -hmm. will be referred to the administration or, or, or something like that. It, it was very brief. So this is adding detail mm -hmm. back to what she originally suggested mm -hmm. was a possible, okay, with her policy that we didn't feel gave as much direction and con direction to the parents or community members and also consistency among school committee members so when we refer we can say here this is what the policy says you should go do so it's I just want to make sure that the okay. um, CMR and all the statutory stuff is up to date and, and well well uh, on that level if it exists in CMR it doesn't necessarily have to be in the book some of the CMRs, they've yeah. changed. Yeah. So we, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the attorney's looking at well, all aspects of that. We're having another me meeting with her, but you know, there's a f cost every time you talk to her and you realize that. So we have a meeting with her on Monday, right? Monday, yep, Monday at then. seven o'clock, Monday at seven o'clock. So um, we're gonna be taking a look at other policies and when that's done, then she's gonna give us some CMR language. Okay. So we gotta be conscious of the cost of the talking to her yeah. because she charges every time you do. Oh yeah. That's the way it is, right? Yeah. You're in the business. Anything else? Um, <laughs> so the second reading, uh, the second, I'm sorry, the uh, second issue is first reading of policy H, H, G, and J, V, uh, J, F, A, B, A. So these policies are obsolete or inconsistent with current law. So it's just. Get rid of them. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, budget. All right. We are looking to amend uh, file KFE, which is also blue in your packet. Uh, KFE is uh, based the fee structure for rental of school building space. Um, and what we need to do is add um, every th all the changes are in bold. Um, everything else is staying the same. So we have. Uh, in previous years, when we created this uh, fee structure, we created groups one, two, and three. And what we're uh, asking is that we also add in a group four, which is specifically for long-term rentals, explicitly for the after-school care of students, long-term being defined as 180 days or more. Um, and uh, because they are long-term, it's basically uh, giving them basically a, a, a break on the fees. So they pay one quarter of the usage fee, um, the energy fees, and then also a damage deposit and all custodial fees. So the custodial fees and the energy fees are what everybody pays, but um, giving them one quarter of the usage fee. Um, and I believe you can see on the back, the other two pa the other page here is um, shows you what the, Part of the reason for doing this is that we have very disparate rates that the after schools are paying. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see the present rate right now, for example, at Bright Start um, is $25,725,000, but at Bracket is $38,600. Mm -hmm. um, and although there might have been some reason or some way as to how these were determined before, this new um, structure brings them one more in line with each other and is more in line with the size of the program, how much space they're using and on all of that. And we felt it's just a lot fairer as far as usage. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work with the after school uh, programs to kind of make sure they are all aware of this. They all understand that this is happening. Um, they are working on, you know, dealing with this increase, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, the other change to the policy is that we would change 
the date uh, originally it stated that the schedule of these uh, fees would be set by May 15th but because after school programs need to give uh, people signing up for the next year usually you have to do it well before May mm -hmm. um, they need those set much closer in the year so we um, and Miss uh, uh, Johnson agreed that moving it to March 15th was not mm. hard and we could do that. So we also pulling that date up so that they understand that as long as they have enough notice mm -hmm. um, that that's, so that is, um, and lots of, lots of thanks <coughs> to um, Paula. Neville. N yeah, Neville, who did all this work investigating. She visited every after school program. She figured out how much space everybody was using um, and came up with this. And it was actually pretty amazing. She came up with the formula, and then when she came up with the numbers, she was amazed at how it actually works, right? It looks mm -hmm. fair, it's fair, given the size of the um, space they're using, mm -hmm. um, brings them all a lot more in line with um, you know, the actual mm -hmm. usage that they have. Any, Any questions can, about this from the members? I just have a, I just, is there supposed to be a period after this long-term rentals explicitly for the after-school care of students period? Is that then one quarter of the usage? Well, that's, yeah, that's one, that's the, de that's the group name. Oh, that's the group that's name. That's the group yeah. name. Like this one, uh, yeah. group okay. one is Arlington Public School and Town related. Yes, it I should be a period. Yes, there was, should be a period. I just have a question. Was there any consideration to maybe staggering the impact of the, of the, what are really kind of huge increases in the, I mean, mm. over a period of two or three or four years to get up to, um, because the difference at Bright Star, it's going to be like twelve thousand. I mean, a daily increase of sixty-eight dollars. It just seems like a, a huge hit all at once. Was there any discussion about um, graduating it somehow? No, there was no. I, again, to comment, uh, Paul, uh, commend Paula on this. She did such great work. I was surprised there was not questions of that or discussion or I'm being treated unfairly. All the people came in and they were appreciative of her work too. And seemed I mean, the woman yeah. who runs Bright Start was fairly, I think that she was probably most yeah, I mean, that's um, vocal about not being able to but she didn't handle it. But yeah. I figure, I mean, yeah. what we wanted to do was change the fee structure. If she wants to work that out with Diane, that's, that's not my concern as to how we roll it out. But I feel like what I want to do is make sure that we have a place mm -hmm. and that we reflect a fee structure specifically for these people so that they know what it is and so if and when a new one opens and um, right. you know and there's a lot of other work going on as well you know creating contracts for all of these people and mm -hmm. and really helping them to know that where their priority is the in the use of the building. The really nice part about this is if a program and it's not going to happen gets smaller the formula is built in for the for the for the fee if the program gets bigger on the square footage is what I'm saying. It's based that way. So this, this will not have to be redone over and over again. Mm -hmm. I don't right, think anybody right, can give right. you a, a, a specific way or formula right. we're not, of the other We're not was, approving the rates no. that each right. school You're would pay. We're just approving formula. the formula that will be used. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, so if, if in fact, I mean, this is at current usage, right. if, 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 if she comes back and says, you know what, I think the problem is, is that we don't really use as much space, right. then, the then the cost would go down. down. Right. right, 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 right. So is this going to be part of the, the policy then? No, that, that's no. just to show you. That's not part of that's the policy. That's a memo. Mm -hmm. That's just the memo. The that's just part of what we gave to the after school program people. And, okay. And we have a whole spreadsheet, if you want, that details what pieces are being used and how she came up with the whole math Great. For awesome. for it. But it's a pivot table? No. <laughs> <laughs> there was no pivoting. Just an Excel spreadsheet. So that's just a first reading. Okay. Uh, we'll have a second reading next time, obviously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Neville. Um, any other subcommittees? No? Faci Willing to report? Real quick, facilities we met. Uh, there was an update on all the programs. Uh, I would like to commend Ms. Johnson in responding. responding to the uh, request, uh, especially by uh, Monotomy Preschool. Uh, having not heard from them, I assume everything is going well. We're working on it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Progress is being made. That's great. And uh, it, it was, I thought it was a good meeting. Thank you. I just, I just figured out we sort of brought up curriculum instruction 
a little higher in the meeting night with your motions than we had planned to do. So that's, yeah. Do you have anything else to report though? No. no. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to make a motion to uh, add a regular school committee meeting uh, a week from tonight, March 6th at 6.30, uh, to go over things such as uh, the architect's report, um, the draft statement of interest, um, perhaps a, uh, another uh, public hearing for the budget. Um, yes. Now that it's been presented to us, the public can maybe speak on it because um, at the front of the meeting tonight, it wasn't really, uh, it didn't make sense. I mean, but it would have been, it would have been perfect if we had had a look at the last meeting. But. And, and possibly um, an appointment of director of special ed. Oh, that could be a big uh, item of discussion. So, um, do I have a second? Second. Like, okay. I would discussion? like to discuss it because yeah, sure. <laughs> I already have another commitment that I cannot get out of from you. six to seven thirty. Yeah. So my suggestion would be: Is there a way that we can break up the meeting and have two short meetings, one on the sixth and one on the thirteenth? Can idea. we possibly do like a seven thirty to nine and a six thirty to eight or something? I I don't know. I just well, one I of don't. the reasons why I'm bringing three six to the four is because the architect can only do three six, right? She only. That's the only date that well, she could come. Well, it's not the only date she could come, oh. but the Board of Selectmen are hearing it on the 10th. Right? Well, can we do 3 6 at 7 30 at night? I mean, what? Yeah, yeah. I that's, that's that's fine. good. I mean, if we, don't, if we, ha oh, if we have an appointment, though, I would like. That we could wait to the 13th, I suppose, but, you know, we could. Huh? Well, I mean, the appointment, the appointment part of the meeting, I mean, it'd be nice of you to hear, but if, you, if you'd miss that piece of it and. Well, you, you think you could come if we're late? Yes. Okay. I am, so, I am committed until 7.30. Let me, let, yeah, let me amend my motion. Belmont. Take it off the table and make a new motion to start it at 7.30 on the 6th. Second. 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 All the discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, great. It's a regular 7.30 to 10. 7.30 to well, no, whatever. Well, it'll be 11, but. Earlier than 10, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah. We haven't done so one of those in, something. what, three years? Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so we'll see how that goes, and if we if we need to three thirteen still, we'll we'll keep it on. If we don't, we'll get rid of it. But right, keep it on. Seven thirty p.m. on the sixth. Mm -hmm. Seven thirty um, on the sixth. May I yeah. comment? Oops, that's the wrong if you're thinking of having not having the thirteenth, mm -hmm. then what you might want to do is start a little bit earlier than seven thirty, so you have a public hearing. And I know I know you'd miss that piece of it, but. I'm the budget chair. You can't have the budget no. hearing no, without no, no, me, no. please. We don't really get a lot of people for these hearings, Kathy. We gotta We're going to go to midnight on next sure. Thursday. I'm excited. Go no, I'm just kidding. Don't come at night. Right. Don't worry about that. I take, take more my time. nap. I don't care. You guys. All right, so we voted that meeting. Uh, secretary's report. Don't give it now. You've got a lot of stuff lined up, I'm sure. Mm. All right. Uh, yes, there's a lot because we didn't have a meeting last time. Mm -hmm. So um, starts off with an email from parent Katie Coughlin about the process and issues surrounding the tools of the mind curriculum in the kindergarten. Email responses from Dr. Bodie and email. Thank you from Ms. Coughlin. Where are my glasses? There they are. MASC legislative bulletin dated January 24th, 2014. Email from Emily Logan in support of the tools of the mind curriculum. Press release forwarded by Dr. Bodhi about improvements in the high school graduation rate in Massachusetts for the seventh consecutive year. Email from Dr. Bodhi that Sherry Donovan has announced her retirement at the end of this school year. Emails about the rescheduled park seminar. Uh, that was long ago and far away. Uh, email with Appendix E of the Part 4 of the Massachusetts Model System for Education Educator Evaluator, the model contract language, forwarded by Dr. Bodhi from Mitchell Chester. Email from Principal Janger announcing the AHS students who earned all state honors for musical achievements. Going paperless survey from Adam Karowski. Copy of the final salary survey undertaken by the town and presented to the selectmen on February 3rd, mm -hmm. 2014. Invitation to an evening of choral voices, K-12, Tuesday, February 4th, 7 p.m. in the AHS Auditorium. Letter from Juliet Lazan in support of the tools of the mind curriculum. Invitation to the Tools of the Mind Informational Night for Parents on Wednesday, 212 at Thompson. Mm. Email from Bishop K. Parents, Jill Fakit and Scott Lever with concerns and questions over the Tools of the Mind curriculum. Press release from Dr. Bodie with the finalist for the Dallin Principal. So funny. Um, and when parents can meet him. Uh, email from Hardy Kindergarten Parent Ann Chabra in support of Tools of the Mind. 
email informing us about candidate for director of special education meeting on Monday, February 10th at 4 p.m. Superintendent's January newsletter. Handouts from the MASC Park presentations. Email about the passing of Ed Burns. Email about students requesting AP government class for next year. Email from Thompson parents, Nilly Perlmutter and Todd Beerson, who support the tools of the mind curriculum. Email information from Tom Ruggieri about things going on at Audison. Email forwarded from Dr. Bodie announcing Department of Elementary and Secondary Education release list of schools to participate in 2014 Park Field Test. Several email with legal expenses from Stoneman, Chandler, and Miller. Email from Dr. Bodie with information about a student assault that happened on Tuesday, February 11th. Email on early closings of the EPS due to the storm on Thursday. Email from Chuck Miller in support of the tools of the mind curriculum. Information on school law symposium on Friday, May 2nd. IBB documents from Jeff Thielman. Email announcing the choice of Thad Dingman as the next principal at Dallin. Email from Hardy Kindergarten parent Emily Logan with her support for Tools of the Mind and an accompanying spreadsheet of dozens of parents and their feedback on Tools of the Mind. Email from Lisa Newmark, a Thompson parent in support of the Tools of the Mind. Email from Robert DiLoretto about the boys' basketball, boys' ice hockey, and wrestling teams on their exciting seasons. And lastly, a letter from Callie Martin on the editorial staff of the Arlington Yearbook requesting that the school committee place an ad in this year's yearbook. When's the deadline on that? It doesn't say. Hmm. It probably passed. <laughs> probably passed. <laughs> the, the note didn't yeah. say. It just said, please take out an ad. Coming up. Hmm. All right. That's what I got. Thank you. Yep. Um, well, I'd like that. Yes, Dr. Butler. So if we're going to be going next week potentially to a vote on this budget, I don't think I am clear. We're not going to vote on the budget. We're not going to vote on the budget. No. That's, not, that's not on the no. calendar. That's, not, not, that's not the calendar. So we are going to go to the 13th. Yeah. Well. I, well no, no, I, I have to confess, I have a huge, I have a huge problem with the 13th okay. just because I didn't know about when, when I, when I, anyway, so. How can you have a big problem with it? It's been on the calendar. I, know. I have a big I problem know. with the 6th because it wasn't on the calendar. We can still vote no, the budget on the 27th. No. We got Why? the CENCOM on the 17th. Yeah. No, we're either voting a budget it. on the 6th or the 13th. That's it. Okay. What does the budget calendar say? The 13th. The 13th. The 13th. Then that's when we're doing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even if we have a really short, small meeting, <laughs> which we've had before. Maybe that would be the night to do then the, um, the, the hearing, mm -hmm. do it all yeah. at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I, I was thinking about this after this discussion tonight. I don't know where the consensus of the committee is in terms of the reserve positions, or you want me to leave it as five reserve, or change it to some administrative support? It was never like there was discussion about it, but there's no. We well, said we'd like the possibility to look at. Well, you know. I think, are you mm. comfortable with your still? Do you are you still firm in your position that you want the five reserve? Well. It, it, it be, might be a, just a moot point. I mean, we may be having to do it anyway. Of I mean, course. that's the thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> so maybe we just leave it. So as maybe it. just leave it as five reserve positions without any mm -hmm. title. Let's let's leave it and then Kirsten. I would like or to Kirsten. hear what proposals are mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. um, how you would alleviate mm -hmm. the burden mm -hmm. and which schools mm -hmm. would be involved. You know, mm -hmm. How would you target what would happen, what would be the cost? And then there are other places we can cut. It's not just mm. reserve mm -hmm. position. So, um, I, I wanted to say that I would be more likely to leave the reserve um, rather than do that because even if we do get mm -hmm. other people to take on that evaluative piece, the principals are part of that evaluation team and cycle and give mm -hmm. their input and do have final say over the hiring and firing mm -hmm. within their buildings. Mm -hmm. And if they're saying that mm -hmm their priority at this time mm -hmm. is this, I, I think it would undermine um, mm -hmm. their leadership within their building for us to be second guessing how, how they're making their staffing decisions. No, This is not related to the current discussion. I would ask the superintendent that if it's her decision to bring forward a candidate, that she give us all the members uh, background on that candidate in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. So candidate we- Candidate for what? SPED director. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm. Because it's, I, it's I did. I said that. Mm -hmm. I was oh. Well, then give us the topic. 
Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll. Fine. Let's hear an action. Mm -hmm. Put your hand up. Did, did any member want to make a motion to direct the superintendent to cut something and put the money to No, that's what we do is we look at the possibilities and then we look at the budget and we can vote to do that if we want and if we don't, we don't. Okay. And we, and we can amend the budget later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other topics or issues to discuss before we adjourn? We have to go into executive session. No, we won't need to go into executive session this time. Hooray. Motion to adjourn. Second. Do we? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh. No, I have nothing. No, I got nothing. I've got nothing. I mean, we're meeting next week. Motion to adjourn. I made the motion There's a motion on the table, table. yeah. All, All set. Say aye. 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 All those against? We are adjourned. Yippee. Good evening, everyone.